Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Hartz, and we're here today to preview every single matchup ahead of Week 18. That's right, Week 18. Wild freaking time. We are living in everyone. As always, I am joined by none other than PFF Zone, Dwayne The Rock McFarlane. Dwayne, how's, how's your Week 18 been, man? Man, it's good. Like, just, uh, I'm excited. You know, fantasy is always fun, but like now we're at that point where it's also like you, you know, we're still thinking about fantasy. Obviously, we're still doing all of our ranks and all those things, but like week 18 is kind of this cool moment to just honestly kind of be an NFL fan. Like, you got all this playoff stuff going on. It's like, who's going to get in? Who's going to be out? Like, what could happen with the seating? So it's like, it has its own natural, you know, kind of sweat going, right? I mean, obviously, we want to put more on it. <laughs> we'll find ways to, like, you know, give ourselves, you know, a high through the weekend by, by gambling on players, you know, or props or whatever the case may be. But yeah, I'm just excited because it's about to be the playoffs, man. So it's like, uh, this is what we're looking forward to the whole season. And Obviously, the Cowboys are in a good are in good shape. So, well, they were in a lot better shape. But <laughs> hey, I'll take the playoffs. Yeah, I finally got closure from my season long fantasy leagues. I, I I got kind of drunk last night and I went through all the championship scores. I was in five championships. Unfortunately, went one and four when it mattered most. So, can still say champ. I know it happens. We can still say champion. Can't say champ, 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 champ like I was hoping, but had to go through all the scores, Dwayne, and make sure like I just had to check, you know, what if I did this? What if I optimized my lineups? Would I still have lost? And I actually felt a little better after seeing that I still would have lost like three or four. So it uh, really just made me think. And then I posted it on Twitter, uh, that meme of like the person crying behind the happy face mask. It's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, look, there's nothing I could have done here. So very uh, weird world we uh, live in sometimes with this fantasy stuff but as you said moving on nfl fandom and for this week just generally week 18 trying again we'll try and play dfs maybe you are a sicko with the championship here basically what Dwayne and i are going to do today is go through the matchups like usual but we're going to put less overall time on going through each and every position you know we don't probably need to talk for two and a half hours about week 18 like we do some of these other ones so really more than ever we're going to try to focus on one key player one key mismatch per side but to start things off Dwayne is actually going to go through the playoff scenario because as we know in week 18 a lot of teams don't have much to play for and if there is one group of players you want to avoid in fantasy land or avoid betting on a team it's one that truly will not have their starters in for more than a couple series at the most so Dwayne let's kick things off with Saturday football Chiefs at the Broncos KC 10 and a half point favorites game total at 44 and a half it does look like the Chiefs are compelled enough to keep Mahomes and company out there for as long as possible yeah. So number one, you know, they, I mean, they're in the playoffs, obviously they won their division, but if they win and then Tennessee loses now, Tennessee playing the Texans on Sunday. So not likely, but look, Tennessee has been Jekyll and Hyde all season. We've seen them. They've really had some of the best wins of the season. Like they've beat the Rams. I mean, they've beat a lot of really good teams, but we've also seen Tennessee show up and lose to the Jets. So it's just, it, it's going to be an interesting to follow, one to follow. And the Texans have actually shown up a few times this year and made games interesting. But if Tennessee does lose and that game's on Sunday, the Chiefs play on Saturday and the Chiefs win, they get the number one seed. So I think there's enough reason there to go ahead and play, you know, even though they're probably thinking, yeah, Tennessee's probably going to win, but there's just enough glimmer of hope because the Titans have laid a goose egg here in a few spots that I think you will see the Chiefs utilize, you know, all of their players. If they've got anybody that's dinged up, yeah, they may keep them out. I know you'll talk about Clyde edwards Delaire here in a second, but I 100% trust their starters this weekend. If it was a game on like the same time as the Texans and Titans, maybe that would be a problem. But again, it's on Saturday. So I'm with you. I do think that Mahomes and company will be out there however long it is needed to get the win. And yeah, I think the big question here comes down to if Claude edwards Zolaire is going to play. We know what Tyreek and Kelsey and Mahomes give us, but Daryl Williams has legitimately been an upside RB2 when Claude has missed time this year. So overall, we've had six games with Daryl as the Chiefs lead back. Touch counts of 24, 8, 19, 22, 20. Most recently, 17, those have produced fantasy finishes as the PPR RB7, 33, 16, 28, 1, and most recently, the RB3. So, you know, Broncos defense, we know that they're not a stomping 
group by any stretch of the imagination but you know how much more effort can they put out with their season over with their offense just limping to the finish line with 13 or fewer points in four of their last five games so you know you show down people out there or if you're again in a season long lead I do think Daryl Williams should be in lineups of most shapes and sizes if Clyde is going to remain sidelined with the shoulder injury just note Andy Reid did say he has a quote-unquote chance to play also said that last week right now Clyde isn't practicing don't be afraid to fire up Daryl as a legit top 15 option if he is going to be out there. Now, Dwayne, on the Broncos, we had Cortland Sutton featured all to himself last week. Still didn't have much going. We, of course, got Javante and Moven splitting things down the middle. Drew Locke will probably be under center again. We'll see about Teddy and the concussion. Who are you most interested in here? Yeah, so for this one, I mean, I think the, there's not anybody I'm interested in, <laughs> to be honest. If they're going to have all these weapons back, I just want to highlight Noah Fant because I know some people are going to see the box score from last week. Um, he was a guy that I did put out, you know, on Twitter. Hopefully you guys are following me. Like the last few weeks, man, I've given you some gold, like with Isaiah McKenzie, Noah Fant, like some huge stuff. Um, and so Fant was the guy that I was really looking at thinking, you know, having Jerry Judy out, having, you know, Tim Patrick out. I liked Sutton. But the fact that, you know, it could be, you know, more hitting the underneath stuff, right? And hitting the easier check down type plays. And Fant was just going to have a bigger opportunity than Sutton because we've just seen the Broncos, even now with Drew Locke back, they haven't really wanted to force the ball down the field outside the numbers. They just haven't wanted to. And we know Vic Fangio just wants to do everything he can in his power to not have Drew Luck throw the forward pass. And if he does throw it, to have him throw it as short as possible so that it does not get picked off. So um, the only thing I would say with Fant, if we get these other guys back, you're just not going to be able to trust him because he really had the same utilization, same utilization as far as his routes and as far, um, you know, over weeks 15 and 16 as he did in 17. So 76 percent, 81 percent. And then last week, 79 percent. The big difference is last week he went from 19 and 18 percent of the targets whenever it spread around across five or six guys to 26 percent of the targets. He was really more the focal point, 28 percent targets per route run. That was his season high last week. So fan was a great option last week, finished as the tight end one. But I think this week he will be outside of my top 12 again, Ian. And you can find Dwayne on Twitter at Dwayne McFarlane. The kid just hit 30,000 followers. And by kid, I mean, you're like 15 years older than me, but you could <laughs> imagine. I thought Mc... you were about to say I was 50. I was about to like, take a trip to Cincinnati. <laughs> Beat about to see ass. how good that leg day went yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Saturday night football going on now. Cowboys at the Eagles. Dallas sitting as a seven point fave game total at a lowly 43. Dwayne, this is one of those where Philly probably should have Jalen Hurts and company out there for most of the game, but it's not guaranteed. The Cowboys, on the other hand, looking like we might not see too much of Dak and company, despite what McCarthy was saying earlier in the week about them playing to win. Yeah, uh, it, we'll have to see. Like, yeah, the, I think, it, I, think I, might have, I might have flipped those acts down. Yeah, so. you did. Oh, you, did. You, you. But <laughs> here's what I'm going to say. Let's just throw this out there now. This Every week is fluid, but like this is going to be more fluid than ever because these things start off one way and by the end of the week it changes. So we'll try to sprinkle in here throughout the show if we know someone's got incentives or things like that and we know about them. Like we'll try to we'll try to add that. There can be certain reasons you want to get these guys out there, but I think as of right now, the way this game, number 1, it's on Saturday, they're playing each other, obviously. The Eagles and the Cowboys are both in. They're both in the playoffs. Dallas cannot move lower than the four seed, even with um, a loss today, but or uh, today, Saturday. <laughs> but if you have a loss by the Rams or by the Bucks on Sunday, which they won't know about, and they win, they can move up, you know, a spot. They can't get to the one seed. That's locked up. The Packers have that, but they could get as high as two um, if they get a loss. If they get two losses, they could get a, get as high as three if either the Rams or the Bucks lose. So I do think that you're going to see the Cowboys starters. I, you could probably see them maybe take it a little easy on Zeke, maybe even on Pollard, some of these guys that we know have been banged up. We could see them at towards the end of the game if the Eagles don't have their starters in and it's just an easy, you know, they're just stomping them. Like, then you could see a situation where maybe they don't play the fourth quarter. But I would put this, the trust rating, the trust factor, Ian, I just did it in, per, in percentages. And I basically just did it either 25, 50, 75, or 100% trust. You heard me with the with the Chiefs, I said 100%. I, I'm 75% on the Cowboys. And so as long as they keep talking the way they're talking, I think there's enough, right? Because if you get to the two seed, then you've got home field until you, unless you have to face the Packers at the end, right? And if the Packers don't make it and you have the two seed, 
well, then you get home field for the rest of the, you know, for the playoffs. Now, are they, is it very likely that both the Rams and the Bucks lose? No, but the Rams do play uh, against the 49ers. So it's not like the, and the 49ers are in must win mode. As far as the Eagles, I'm a little less confident in them just because like there's, it doesn't really help them. And no matter what, they've got to play the Rams or they're going to have to play the Bucks. Um, they I don't think they really care which which team they play. They probably don't want to play either one of those teams. Um, so as far as Philly, I don't think they're really going to care about their seed. They know it's going to be a, a road game. So they're the team I'm a little more concerned that we won't see their starters. And yeah, you're probably looking at my grid that I put on our show sheet. It's the opponent that you're reading now. <laughs> and so yeah, it's for Philly. I'm I'm zero percent trust in the starters. I think we could see them start the game, but I don't think we're going to see many of them finish the game. It's week 18, everyone. I'm trying out here. But yes, the specific quote from Mike McCarthy said, we are going to play to win the game. We're going to Philadelphia and we're going to line up to do what we need to do in order to win the game. So it doesn't look like he'll be resting the starters. But to your point, Dwayne, you know, really doubt that Zeke's going to be pushed to his limit. And know if Cooper, anyone that we end up seeing, you know, maybe on the injury report limited, maybe we see those snaps dialed back just a bit. And it could be the same thing with Philly, man. Like why bring back Miles Sanders right now? Why, you know, ask Jalen Hurst to run the ball? 10 plus games in this spot so with the Cowboys though I do think if Dak's gonna be out there he should be able to dice up the secondary we saw what happened in the first meeting and when you're not able to pressure Dak bad things are usually happening you start seeing him getting that rhythm and it's like how is this offense ever going to have another incomplete pass again so you know every week I publish my mismatch manifesto I look at the offense's pressure rates and the defense's pressure rates combine those numbers and you know be able to identify the best mismatches throughout the league Dak has the fifth best combined pressure rate on the week and when he has more than two and a half seconds to throw man seventh best pff passing grade with the third most touchdowns on the season so yeah it sucks they lost michael gallup but cedric wilson isn't a scrub himself and when you have tyron smith back in that offensive line humming that's what produces the best version of this cowboys offense so expecting plenty of snaps here in terms of football outsider situation neutral pace cowboys are number one in the league philly sitting at number four Dwayne, the last note I'll make is it's I'm really interested to see what happens with the, with these wide receivers. And we touched on this briefly in our Week 17 usage notes, but I dove more into it in an article I wrote today, the 10 offseason fantasy storylines that will help define the 2022 season. You all can find that on PFF.com. But man, out of all these Cowboys receivers that have played a snap this year, CeeDee Lamb, Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup, um, Cedric Wilson, Noah Brown, even Malik Turner, only CD is absolutely guaranteed to be back on the team because Gallup, Cedric, Noah Brown and Malik Turner are all unrestricted free agents and Amari if they want to cut him after June 1st they can save 20 million against the cap and only eat 2 million in dead money so I think the Gallup injury probably complicates them moving on from Cooper we'll see either way man like you know looking ahead to 2022 potentially with CD Lamb like he's already someone that we're probably going to have a hard time ranking outside of our top five or six receivers God forbid he's lined up for truly one of the largest workloads in the league now, Dwayne, you kind of said it, man. We're, we don't have much confidence in these Philly starters to be out there. So any of these guys you're really hoping to lean on fantasy other than maybe Boston Scott continuing to do his thing? Yeah, so to top this off, we also have on Monday, they added Boston Scott, Jordan Howard, Dallas Goddard. They're all on the COVID list. Oh, so, great. Yeah, so it could be a Kenny Gainwell week. So if you're in DFS, like Kenneth Gainwell is definitely a name to keep an eye on. Now, I don't know how many of the offensive line starters will be out there for the Eagles. <laughs> I have no clue, but we could see a very heavy dose of Kenneth Gainwell in week seven or week 18. So that would be the one name I would throw out there. Gainwell is a guy that we both liked in the preseason. They just ended up with too much of a rotation, but he can catch the check down passes. He's great in the two minute offense. And if the Cowboys are playing their starters and the Eagles are not, there's going to be a good chance, right? You're going to see the Eagles be behind. I don't know that they'll follow a normal game script, though. Like, if you're basically conceding victory, you know, um, to the other team, it, I mean, does it make sense to even follow a normal game script? Oh, we're behind. We better run our <laughs> hurry up. I don't even know. But Kenneth Gainwell would stand the most um, to gain if for some reason those guys are all out with COVID or they just decide to hold them out um, due to, you know, just the circumstances. And they don't really care about, you know, whether they have the eight, uh, the seven seed or the six seed. 
Game well's got a lot to gain, huh? You come up with that one yourself, <laughs> McFarland. Yeah, yeah, he could do well. <laughs> All right, moving on to the other <laughs> NFC East matchup. Starting off on Sunday, we got Washington at the New York football Giants. No playoff implications in this one because both these teams suck and have already been eliminated from playoff contention. How bad are they? Just seven teams this year have you actually stole my line, Ian. <laughs> like, you know, I have that. It's it's patented when you say that somebody sucks. Like, I know oh, it's true. been around a long time, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they objectively suck. Like, I'm not even trying to be a dick here. Like, Uh-oh. I don't know how I, I, else so to. So when I say someone sucks, it's not a I got you. Go ahead. Yes, you're just going off eye test. I'm using hardcore analytics. So seven teams with a point differential of 100 points or worse against them. Washington, Atlanta, the Giants, Detroit, the Jets, Texans, and the league worst Jacksonville Jaguars. So truly some horrendous teams out there on the gridiron come Sunday. We talked a little bit about Jarrett Patterson's usage without Antonio Gibson on our week 17 pod which was out there on Tuesday and not week 17, but we just broke down some of the key notes. So I wanted to highlight Terry McLaurin, who don't count now, but you can count if you want. He has caught passes from Alex Smith, Dwayne Haskins, Colt McCoy, Case Keenum, Kyle Allen, Taylor Heineke, and Garrett Gilbert in his career. Free this man. With that said, he kind of does own this New York Giants defense. They've faced off four times in his short career. Seven catches, 86 yards. Seven catches, 74 yards. Seven catches, 115 yards, and a score in this season. 11 catches for 107 yards and a touchdown. He does have four top 10 finishes. I can think of worse GPP dark to throw in tournaments this week. He is the type of wide receiver, I think, with his mix of downfield ability and pristine route running can give someone like James Bradbury a lot of problems. Bradbury going up against a Cortland Sutton type, you know, one of these bigger, just contested catch artists, if you will. He can give them problems, not so much a quick-footed baller like Terry. So hasn't been the best year, but we know Terry has those boom potential. Wouldn't shock me at all to see him go for over 100 and a touchdown against this defense that, again, he owns. Now, Dwayne, with the Giants, I saw a stat. I think it was from Dan Arvlosky, uh this morning. Okay. I want to say the Giants have scored one touchdown in their last 38 drives. 35. <laughs> one touchdown in the last 35 possessions from Dan Arvlosky. Oh, my God. Uh, anything, Dwayne, anything. I mean, I can tell you that the Giants have led by four or more points on 5% of their plays all season. <laughs> all season? <laughs> I mean, yeah, 55 plays out of 674. No. That's including penalties. But, I mean, out of 1,043, yeah. So, uh, hadn't been good, you know, for the Giants. And a team that, like, on paper, when you look at all the weapons they have, like, even next year, I'm sure we'll talk ourselves back into some of these guys. Like, you know, yeah, I mean, how do you really blame them down the stretch with all the – we thought Daniel Jones was bad. Well, now you see what bad, like even, (laughs) so if Daniel Jones is bad, like this is atrocious, I guess, is what you would call this with Mike Glennon. And so Glennon's going to be out. He's going to have wrist surgery. So we're going to have Jake Fromm, uh, the former Georgia Bulldogs, going to be back out there rocking it. Um, Wasn't so good the last time he showed up. It did crack me up, though, in like sport when ESPN or if it was NFL Network, I can't remember, but when they showed him showing up and he looked like he was like in, you know, looks like he was like just your average working man, like going to work (laughs) like at a sawmill or something, you know. Um, so we'll we'll see what Jake Fromm shows up in. But either way, you do not want to be using any of these players, obviously, this weekend. But last week, it was so funny, Ian. So they were trailing on – they trailed by four more points last week on 98% of their snaps. So that was awesome. And they still ran the ball 70% of the time. Didn't even so try you, one. Didn't even try No, exactly. So if you want the – if you ever want to think of, uh, you know, a team that's just trying to show up and get the game over as fast as possible and get back on the bus – that's what the Giants are doing right now. Um, the only thing, other, so you can't use any of these players. Um, Barkley did get to 100 yards last week, even though he was still only, even though he split snaps again with Booker. But it's because they ran the ball so much and they stayed committed to it. Barkley was able to get his 100. Still finished, you know, barely inside the top 30 though in PPR back. So Barkley will be outside of my top 24 again, and honestly, closer to Devonte Booker than anything else you would want to use in a fantasy lineup. I've never been so depressed seeing Saquon go for over 100 rushing yards than I was last week. Um, It's sad. It feels like it's been an eternity since we've seen good Saquon Barkley. Look, I'm a believer. I feel it's still in there somewhere. I mean, the guy doesn't have a ton of miles. You know, like he's got injuries piling up. But if he could just get into a situation where he could, you know, be utilized, you know, correctly. Just stay healthy. He's just got to stay healthy. Please. 
please. And also just to put how bad Mike Glenn has been in the context, he is dead last in both big time throw rate and turnover worthy play rate, which means he's making the f- lowest rate of elite <laughs> tight window throws in the league while simultaneously making more mistakes than any other quarterback. So that's what John. How much fans. did the Bears give him that year? Dude, way too freaking much. <laughs> it's like plus 15 million. That's a lot. Oh, man. A lot of Hell. money for a giraffe. All right. Bengals at the Browns. <laughs> Bengals at the Browns. Cleveland six point favorites. Game total at 30 freaking eight. Uh, speaking Wednesday, Joe Burrow did say he does not expect to play in week 18 against the Browns. He is dealing with a knee injury. He said it was sore, but he also said he felt it was healthy enough to play if needed. We also got Joe Mixon already ruled out with COVID. So, Dwayne, seems like a situation where even if the Bengals still have a little something to play for with some of these guys banged up, they might just take their foot completely off the gas. Yeah, that could totally happen here. So here, you know, here's the thing I would say. If you get a Kansas City loss on Saturday, because that's one of the things they need to have a shot, right, at that, at that number one seed. So if for some reason the Chiefs lost on Saturday, I think you could see a change in plans by the Bengals. I think that still doesn't guarantee it because in order to get there, they need a Tennessee, Kansas City, and New England loss, and they would need a win. That would put them into the one seed, which would be worth it, right? You get, you get home field advantage the whole way. The other way they could do it is get a win, and Buffalo also wins, and then you get Tennessee and Kansas City to lose. That would also equal the number one seed. But if they just decide that, you know what, we're just going to get healthy. We're going to make sure we're ready for this wild card game. We're going to do our thing. They can't fall below number four. They've already locked up their division. Baltimore can't catch them. The Steelers can't catch them. They're all on the outside looking in. So I think unless Kansas City loses, you can, and I put 25% trust the starters. And that was just basically giving, saying, hey, there's a chance Kansas City loses that game. Yeah. And if, if that happens, then this could adjust to like 100%. But we'll get more news as we get closer to the game. Also worth noting that Zach Taylor said potentially Jamar Chase will be playing in this one. So, yeah, really going to be tough to trust any of these guys, but we will know more by Sunday For Jamar morning. Chase, I think the interesting thing, and I don't know if you have this in, but he, he just needs 45 yards, and he'll have the single-season rookie record all Ooh. time. So I think that's what they're probably going to try to do for Jamar Chase is get him his 45 yards. I mean, let him go down as the all-time leader in yardage You know, as a rookie. Um, Bill Groman. Uh, for the Houston Oilers had 1,473. And if you guys don't follow him, that's from Anthony Amico. He's got a nice Twitter thread going on this stuff. He works over at Establish the Run. I think he does work for football guys as well. He's a great follow on Twitter. It's actually at... Uh, what is it? Anthony? Is it a- a- Amico or something? Yeah, uh, No, yeah, it's at A-M-I-C-S-T-A. So Amicsta. A-M-I-C-S-T-A. So you guys go give him a follow. He's got a great thread. Go check it out. Love Anthony. Yeah, I just hope that if they want to do it with Chase, they can get it quickly. It was so awkward a couple years ago when yeah. the Panthers wanted to get Make McCaffrey. Play whole game. They wanted to get McCaffrey over a thousand receiving yards and like it took until the third quarter and they're like already down 40 points, just feeding McCaffrey these underneath targets. And I was like, guys, I get it, but come on. Here. And this so, is different because the Bengals are in the playoffs. Like, yeah. so I don't think they'll do that. I think they'll either come out and get it or they won't. But I, to your point, I don't think we would see something like that. My guess is they're going to try to pepper him right away in the first drive. Just a few notes about these receivers who, again, are going to be tough to trust this week. Tyler Boyd, league high 88 targets without a single drop this season. Only Hunter Henry at 69 and Cordero Patterson at 62 are also over 50. And with Chase and Higgins, again, it's 1A, 1B. In terms of pure expected PPR points per game, Chase is at 14.1 this year. Higgins is at 14. The difference is that Chase is the wide receiver three in fantasy points above expectation. Higgins is 17. Shout out to Boyd at 14. So obviously, Brown very good defense the last time they allowed an offense to go for over 275 passing yards was Justin Herbert and the Chargers in week five the question is can this offense keep up because the Browns joined the Jaguars Giants and Texans as the only teams with fewer than 14 points in eight or more of their games this year and Dwayne with Baker Mayfield now done for the year we can officially say that Odell Beckham since the Browns cut him has more receiving touchdowns than Baker has fed to his wide receivers we can even get worse Worse, man, you know, I've been using that stat since the Browns got rid of OBJ. But on the season, Donovan Peoples Jones has three touchdowns receiving. Jarvis Landry has one. Rashard Higgins has one for a total of five. That's how many OBJ has since week 12 alone. You know, just stats. I'm not here to 
prove a point. I'm just listing some numbers, everyone. So don't get mad at me. Get mad at the numbers if you so desire. So, Dwayne, without Baker in the picture, maybe it'll be a Nick Chubb show. But if we learned anything from Monday night, it seems like that the Browns are kind of well aware of their position, might not see the sort of volume to one single player that fantasy managers might be hoping for. Yeah, so we did get Darius Johnson put onto the COVID list yesterday. Um, I think it was yesterday. It actually might have been today. Hang on, let me double check. Because if it's today, like anybody that goes on from today and past, they're right, done. Yeah. They're done. So they're not going to play. No, it was Tuesday. So there is a chance Dearness Johnson could have returned. But we've also got a situation where we don't know if we'll have Kareem Hunt. He was trending towards playing, got some limited practices in last week. And then on Monday, we were told he's not going to play. Well, now, if you had any doubts about Kareem Hunt, why would you play him in this game? But yeah. then we also found out after the game that Nick Chubb had some sort of a rib injury early in the game in the first half. And I guess he had to kind of like manage the pain, probably got a shot or something, then came back in for um, the second half of the game and actually played pretty well. So we'll have to keep an eye on that situation. But obviously, if we if we do get a Browns team that is going to be without Dearness Johnson, going to be without um, Kareem Hunt and is going to be facing all backups from the Bengals and the starting line is out there for the Browns. Like, oh my, I love Nick Chubb and this weekend in that situation. If Kareem Hunt is active, like you got to treat him more like, you know, RB 15, 16 range. You know, you can, you can push him to a high end RB one. I'm never going to, I'm never going to not RB one, RB two. I'm never going to argue with you about Nick Chubb, you know, as far as, you know, his ability, we all know what's there. Like he's among the league leaders and everything that matters, explosive plays, yards after contact, missed tackles, force per attempt. Like he's way up there in all those. Like, you know, we talk about Javonta Williams and Jonathan Taylor. The other name that you see mixed in with those guys, every time you look at those stats is Nick Chubb and he's been there for years. Um, so with Chubb, if for some reason, he get, play 42% of the offense, Offensive snaps I, last week, Dwayne. That's well, what pisses they, me off. Well, I know. Stefanski says it's something to do with an injury in the first half. I don't know. But anyway. He was limited. He was limited in practice with uh, ribs and chest. So yeah. maybe so that's what maybe Stefanski, Stefanski isn't lying to us all. <laughs> so, we, I mean, we could. Who knows? They could just say we're not going to play Nick Chubb this weekend. <sighs> if, and then you could just see Kareem Hunt. Either way, if you get a one-person backfield in Cleveland, whether it's Chubb, I would have said most likely just put your chip on Dearness Johnson, but now that he's on the COVID list, right? And we've seen the way when these guys return, it's tough for him to handle a full workload. They're probably going to have to have, um, you know, one of Chubb or um, Hunt active with Johnson if he's one of the guys. But if you get down to a situation where it could be either or Nick Chubb or Kareem Hunt and the others inactive, like they've got to be a top five back this week against all Bengals backups. Steelers at the Ravens. More AFC North goodness, if you want to call it that. Baltimore, five and a half point favorites. Game total at 41 and a half. Got some, uh, you know, enough going on here, Dwayne, with the uh, playoff scenario that both of these teams should be going out there trying to give it their all and get that W. Yeah, I mean, both of them have to win, right? They're on the outside looking in right now. So whenever you look at the Steelers, um, if they win and they get an Indianapolis loss, which is against the Jaguars, good luck with that. They're <laughs> in. Unless Vegas and the Chargers tie on Sunday night. Dude, I want that scenario to happen so bad. (laughs) Yeah, those are always the fun, the most fun ones, right? Um, You know, it's a scenario like that. It's just like the the Steelers Steelers win, (laughs) the the Colts somehow lose, and Vegas and the Chargers tie. (laughs) Yeah, so I think 100%. Like, you trust all the starters for the Steelers. Um, As far as the Ravens go, really the same thing. They've got to win. Now, they've got a tougher road to get there, but they've got to win, number one. And they play in the early window, so it's not like they're going to know if any. And then they have so many things they need, it wouldn't even matter. Like they need like a freaking abacus or like a calculator on the sideline <laughs> to keep up with it all the time. But they've got to win, and they need an and they need Indian Indianapolis, Cleveland, L.A. Chargers, Miami losses. Like they need all those things, and then they're in. So they got to win, and they need those four teams to lose. Obviously, the Browns and the my and um, the Dolphins; those are strength of schedule things um, based on common opponent on common opponents. So I think you can trust all the starters from both of these teams. Quick shout out to Deontay Johnson: one hundred catches, one thousand one hundred and ten yards, eight scores on the year in fifteen games. Guy really had a nice breakout, but I think the you know bigger. Not necessarily a trend out of Pittsburgh specifically, but the, you know, 
The guy getting fed the ball even more than Deontay was Najee Harris this year. And it's not going to be the easiest matchup for him. Actually, second toughest matchup of the week in terms of combined yards before carry per yards before contact per rush. Excuse me. And with Najee, man, other than last week, which, hey, I saw a stiff arm. That was fantastic. 188 rushing yards. Good on you, Najee. He is still after that dead last in fantasy points below expectations. So 107 scoreless yards on 26 touches versus Baltimore. Kind of seems like that could be an issue again Baltimore joins San Fran the Rams and the Panthers as the only four defenses allowing less than one yards before contact per carry so not an easy matchup he'll need to win with volume but with that said Dwayne Najee at this point is a dying breed he being the three down running back is a dying breed I went back and I looked at all the running backs per year with at least 300 touches per season. And look, 2000, we had 19 of them. 2001, 13. 2002, 16. We move along. By 2008, we're at nine. 2013, we're still at nine. 2014, five. 2018, five. 2019, we had a brief bump up back to nine. But in 2020, just four. And in 2021, only three running backs had at least 300 touches. Najee Harris, Jonathan Taylor, Joe Mixon. That is, in fact, a 20-year low. So truly seeing it go from 19, imagine playing fantasy football. And I guess you can't imagine this, Dwayne, you did it. 19 freaking running backs had over 300 touches in the year 2000. Now we have just three in the year 2021. So that's why we say volume is king because not many freaking people have it. Najee is one of them. So wouldn't expect too much of that to change for him in 2022. He'll continue to be what the kids like to call a volume based RB1. Now, Dwayne, we'll see if Lamar is back. Certainly, you know, didn't seem like he was on the best track to do it last week. With that said, we have seen, with the good news, with this Ravens passing attack throughout the years, whether it's Lamar, whether it's Huntley, whether it's Josh Johnson, they're still capable of putting up numbers through the air. Yeah, and I think really the big story here, like if I'm only going to talk about one thing on a team, it's Mark Andrews. <laughs> Dude, since week 10, his finishes tight end three, tight end five, tight end four, tight end 13, tight end two, tight end two, tight end one, tight end three. Ooh. Number one tight end on the season, obviously, right now gets the Steelers. Tight end strength of schedule is not great. It's a three out of 10, but his overall matchup, so when you include his skill set versus the defenders he'll play, it's a 23. Uh, which is going to be in the top five on the slate for the week. Um, you've got the Steelers giving up 9.4 points per game to opposing tight ends. But let's be honest, when you have studs like Andrews and Kelsey, you don't even give a shit about the matchup. <laughs> Sorry, earmuffs, but you don't care, especially for tight ends like that are this good. They're typically just a mismatch against anyone. And so you're going to be rolling out there um, with Andrews. The other thing with Andrews, Again, another hat tip, hat tip to Anthony. I'm just looking straight at his Twitter feed. Uh, 141 receiving yards. He gets to the single season record as a tight end. Wow. Good note there. And yeah, with his lead on Travis Kelsey, how many points does he have? I got the wrong ear up. That's great. With his lead on Kelsey, he's looking to snap. Okay. He's up 29 PPR points right now. So assuming Andrews does anything and Kelsey doesn't go absolutely berserk, this will mark the first year since 2015 that we have had someone other than Travis Kelsey work as the overall fantasy tight end one. Really, since 2011, man, it's only been Gronk, Jimmy Graham, Travis Kelsey, and now probably Mark Andrews. So truly awesome company for him to be in. Great year. I know it's disappointing for the Ravens as a whole, but Mark Andrews, man, that dude Wouldn't it be special. fitting? He, the, the record he would break would be Kelsey's. That'd be awesome. Let's go. Go get go get that shit, Mark. Earmuffs. Packers at the Lions. Green Bay, four-point favorites. Game total, 44 and a half. Dwayne, we cannot trust Aaron Rodgers and company. With that said, some of those incentives might be worth playing oh, just a, a little bit for. Rodgers has a ton of them. Like... You guys just go check Anthony's thread. <laughs> but there's unless it's going to cover some of these, but there's a bunch. Um, and there's there's a for uh, Devonte Adams, there is an incentive just for games started that he's active. So we can see a situation where it's like, hey, get out there, kid, play play two snaps. Actually, just be active. Like you could see him be active, right? And everybody's going to get excited. Oh, he's going to play, and it could just be to give him his thirty grand yeah. that he gets <laughs> per game bonus for being out there. But yeah, there's really nothing for the Packers to play for. They they're the number one seed. It's locked in. Even if they lose, it doesn't matter. So I have zero percent trust in their starters. And oh, by the way, I would include AJ Dillon in that. Um, I think A.J. Dillon and Aaron Jones, we've seen now, we've seen them go back and forth. Um, we don't – and it's not tied to just one utilization thing, Ian. Like I haven't been able to see, oh, it's trailing. Oh, it's leading. Oh, it's long down in distance. It's two-minute offense. They mix them in all sorts of ways. It seems to be matchup-based. 
It's something to do with the team that they're playing against and their personnel that's really driving which guy gets the ball the most. So having said that, I think they see them as 1A, 1B. So I think of A.J. Dillon as a co-starter with Aaron Jones. And so I don't think I wouldn't. I wouldn't put a huge chip down on, oh, wow, Aaron Jones is hardly going to play. It's going to be all A.J. Dillon. I think if you're wanting to put a DFS chip down, like the more likely one would be really Patrick Turner. Matt LaFleur did say, quote, unquote, we're going to play our guys and we're going to approach it like any other game. I think Coach LaFleur is being a liar with uh, Full that of statement. It. <laughs> Full of it. As Dwayne did mention, though, there are some awesome uh, incentives for Rodgers to potentially go after. Snaps, you can earn an extra 100K if, you know, they... Yeah, basically, it's just, you know, okay, 100K each for top three and pass rating, completion percentage, interception percentage, yards for attempt, touchdown passes. He has a lot to potentially play for. And, you know, now he's kind and of he, going. He could get there on the touchdown. Sorry, Ian. He could get there on the touchdown passes. Like, so that's one you could see. Like, they just play them in the first half. And basically, the coaches just tell them, look, you have the first half to get there. Like, I could see this conversation going on before the game. <laughs> and then Rodgers, it's the it's the freaking Lions. He's going to come out and lot him up for 350 and three touchdowns in the first half. Um, completion percentage, um, he's in fourth place. He's got to be in the top three. So, he could get there on that one. Um, so I think he could get there on those two, um, yards per attempt. He could get there, but it, I think it would be tougher. Like Stafford's ahead of him and he's in third and Stafford has a game he needs. So, I mean, he could actually get to all three of these. Brady's the guy I'm thinking of where it's a little tougher. Also a little pissed off narrative going on for Rogers. I'm sure a lot of you call it. We had a Chicago reporter, Hub Arkush, say that he doesn't think that you can be the biggest jerk in the league and be the most valuable player. So Hub will not be voting for Aaron Rodgers for MVP. Rodgers' response, I think he's a bum, an absolute bum. His problem is I'm not vaccinated. Maybe just for this season, make it the most vaccinated player award. So I'm going to agree that Hub is a bum. And if uh, the NFL <laughs> wants to give me his MVP vote, I will gladly give it to my guy, Cordero Ian, you, Patterson. You've just got to be beat writer axe to grind <laughs> i mean just this, this all stems back to the 49ers beat writers <laughs> look Dwayne, i don't go on twitter and talk about politics or really anything other than football know, but people have their opinions on it that's great but to let that come and impact your work this I way agree. and to just be objectively wrong is uh, a little too much for me so i'm with you you know, to say he's the biggest jerk, uh, I don't know. He's a bum, we, Rock. He's a bum. He's a bum. He's a bum. But okay, enough of that. With Rodgers, I just want to point out that we all know this is a great matchup for him, and he is on quite the heater. So, Dwayne, I could see something like uh, that Bills game in Week 17 last year with Josh Allen. Where just are you going to rank Rodgers? Like, he's the one I was the most torn on of guys that I know don't have to play because I was thinking through this scenario. Um, so, like, right now I've got him in my third tier, and I've got him down, like, around 10. You know, I think that, yeah, there's going to be the line of guys you're feeling like pretty good in. And then it's just going to be Rogers. Right like I can't there. start him over Herbert must win. No. Stafford needs to win. Dak, we've been told they're going to play. They can gain something by playing, you know, Mahomes, Brady, Murray, Allen all have something to play for. Yeah. And then you get to Jalen Hurts. OK, you could play him over him. Right. Yeah. That's and then probably about the to, line. Then you get to Trey Lance, you know, which we like um, if he plays. It could be Jimmy G, but it's probably right in there. Where do you go, Taysom or Rodgers? Right now, I have Rodgers a bit ahead of Taysom. It's That's just the tough. Lions. Like, yeah. Russ lit the Lions up for four tees. Like, <laughs> do we even think that, like, the Seahawks were capable of four touchdowns and, like, eight quarters of play, much less, oh. like, four? It's so true. And I, I also like the point about A.J. Dillon being there with the starters. I think it's similar to Tony Pollard and the Cowboys. Like, we'll just end up seeing the third running back soak it up once they decide to make the move to Jordan Love. With that said, shout out to Dillon. 77% of his carries this year have gained at least two yards after contact. Nobody else is above even 73%. So it really was an awesome year from Dillon. Dragon Fools week after week after week. Now, Dwayne, with the Lions, the sun got himself a Monroe St. Brown. He can't be stopped. How are we not just locking this guy in the DFS lineups? And, I mean, what, what is he? Like, wide receiver two overall at this point? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I think you can make an argument for anywhere. Um, I, we talked about this on the show yesterday, but it's just going to be a – he's going to be a player that's going to be very interesting to see where he winds up in the ranks. Obviously, we're going to keep an eye on, like, what kind of weapons they had, all that stuff. But I think for now, I'm thinking he will be in my wide receiver three range with the ability to move higher 
based on what we find out. Maybe I need to start off with him as a low end wide receiver too. I don't know. You know, go with the Ian move, the low end wide receiver too. Um, so as far as Amon Ross St. Brown, like his finishes, I mean, you just mentioned, you know, kind of where he's at over the last four weeks, but here are his finishes over the last five games, wide receiver six, wide receiver 26, wide receiver six, wide receiver six, wide receiver two. And he doesn't care who his quarterback is. It could be pretty bad Jared Goff, or it could be journeyman backup Boyle. Like it doesn't matter. <laughs> like he's doing it with all of these guys. Um, I will say the Packers defense has been pretty good, but we don't know how many of the starters we're going to see from the Packers or how long we're going to see them. Right. I don't really think we're going to see the Packers risk a lot of these defensive players, you know, especially, you know, how long it's taken them to get their secondary back to full health. Um, and they've been playing good despite that. So I think in the second half, you're going to see a Mon Ross St. Brown out there against complete scrubs. So I don't think there's any way to have him outside of the top 24 this week. Colts at the Jaguars, Indy sitting as 15 and a half point favorites. Game total is at 44. The Jaguars fans are planning to dress up as clowns to go to this game, Dwayne. And <laughs> I've had a rule in my entire life, my entire fantasy football career, that when the fans are planning on dressing up as clowns, you need to play the best player on the other team in that matchup, particularly in Indy's case, when it does look like they are going to be fully invested trying to win this one because they need to to make the playoffs. Yeah, Jonathan Taylor could be $12,000 on DK, and he would still be <laughs> the most on running back on the slate this weekend, like, and rightfully, slow, and rightfully so. But, yeah, as far as just, you know, what the Colts have got to do, you know, they've just got to win, and they're in. Um, the other option is they get losses from uh, the Ravens and the Chargers, or they get losses by the Chargers, the Steelers, and the New England Patriots. They can so technically they could back in, but all of those scenarios that involve backing in um, are they have there are teams that play in the late window, right? The Chargers play on Sunday night. New England plays a late game. The Steelers play, I believe, a late game as well. Um, so the NFL actually did a good job with the way the schedule is set up, you know, this weekend and who's playing when and like can't just be completely scoreboard watching, right? You kind of got to go play your game, which is what they want. And so the Jaguars and the Colts kick off at one o'clock on Sunday Eastern time. So I think you can 100% trust all of this, all of the Colts starters specifically and, you know, foremost. Jonathan Taylor. This was the matchup in the final game of the 2020 season. Jonathan Taylor in that one, 30 carries, 253 yards, and a pair How of many? scores. He had 253, so he 253. needs... 266 from 266. 2000 this year, so only 13 more than what he got against them this very wow. situation last year. I absolutely love the potential for him to go get that. And he's also, you know, not as sexy of a counting stat, but he's also in select company in terms of the most PPR points above expectation. He's at plus 7. 70.3 right now. Uh, we only have uh, numbers for this going back to, I believe, 2018. But the only other guys above even 60 were 2020 Alvin Kamara at plus 71.5 and 2019 Derrick Henry at plus 76.4. So Jonathan Taylor, we know he's incredible. And how can we really quantify that? By showing that he's about to be the biggest outlier based on his usage that the running back position has seen over the past four years. So yeah, Jonathan Taylor, you're RB1. Your heart's RB1. Everyone's RB1. Dwayne, Jaguars, you got anything? <laughs> I love your tone. Have you ever seen Wayne's World? Uh, not, not the whole thing. I've seen the Bohemian okay, Rhapsody. Yeah. There's scene. a funny part in it where they're talking about, you know, they're doing their cable show from their basement, and they're talking about different states, and then they get to Delaware, and he goes, hello, I'm in Delaware. Like, <laughs> I was like, hello, I have the Jaguars. Here are uh, the Jaguars. <laughs> there's, there's nothing really to say here. Let's not, let's not waste people's time. Uh, Dari got there last week on a late reception, you know, for you that he took in for a touchdown. And I think, uh, you know, that was probably the happiest moment of Trevor Lawrence's uh, life to get off the snide on the passing uh, touchdown, you know, uh, slide that he had been on. But I think we'll see Dari out there again, pro over half of the snaps, 50, 60% of the time. Like, so think Rex Burkhead, like, it, but it's against it's Colts defense. They're playing for a lot. It's going to be wild, crazed animal. Darius Leonard, like going, you know, he's going to be going crazy. So I wouldn't really be that excited about Agamba Wale. I think he's a high end RB three based on usage alone. Guess how many points the uh, Jaguars are implied to score this week. Oh man. I have it in front of me, but I wish, I mean, I'm not going to look at it though. Cause I have it. Uh, 12. Oh, 
14. 14. The, the Jets are at 12 and a half, the only team worse. Yeah, stay the hell away uh, from this offense if you enjoy Jesus. trying to make money. Bears at the Vikings. Minnesota, three and a half point favorites. Game total, 44 and a half. Both teams have already been eliminated from playoff contention. But it does look like Cousins is going to be out there for the majority of the game. Mike Zimmer did say he will start. And then when they got to ask about <laughs> Kellen Mond getting playing time, Mike Zimmer said, uh, yeah, not particularly. He already sees him every day. So why bother playing Mond <laughs> in week 18? One of the funnier uh, press that's, conferences. That's not a good. That's not a good. That's not good. Like, that's not a good yeah. comment. <laughs> not great. Not great, Dwayne. Anyway, on the Bears side of things, they will be starting Justin Fields again, looking like Matt Nagy's last game as head coach in Chicago. And we'll just know with Fields' last five games, QB3, QB9, Dud, QB29, then QB8, and then QB10 against this very Vikings defense. The only defense is worse than the Vikings, allowing fantasy points for game to QBs, Washington, Baltimore, Kansas City, and Atlanta. So Fields, good enough spot this week. You know, I think he deserves to be right on that QB1 borderline, probably a few spots ahead, given uh, some of the teams that, you know, we just realized aren't going to be playing their starters. I think it's really fun to look ahead to 2022, though, because we've seen really in each of the past three years, at least one second-year quarterback make that leap and put together an awesome season. And Kyler Murray was really the only one that was all that expensive in the preseason. This year, Justin Herbert, Joe Burrow, Jalen Hurts, all top eight fantasy QBs, each had an ADP as the QB8 or lower in August. When you look at Lamar and Patrick Mahomes, literally put together two of the most productive fantasy seasons we have ever seen. Those came in both of their second years. Lamar was the QB14 and Mahomes was the QB16. So obviously, we don't have any ADP data out for next season or anything, but our resident ranking expert, Nathan Yonke, did come out with his uh, 2022 way too early top 250, and in that list, we had Trey Lance as the QB 10, which I think makes sense. People will probably be up on him, assuming Jimmy G is out of the picture, but Justin Fields all the way down there at QB 19, so a lot to still see what's going on, but man, Dwayne, I can just see it now, man. If we're going to be able to get Fields with an ADP outside the top 15 or 18 QBs, going to be there all day for late round quarterback season, because at that point, it's not you're not you don't have to build your whole team around him. He can just be a high upside lottery ticket that you take at the end of draft. So keep an eye on that ADP because Fields, unlike Zach Wilson, save for a truly remarkable touchdown run last week, Trevor Lawrence, Mac Jones. Fields has at least shown that QB1 ceiling for an extended stretch in 2021. I know he got banged up. He couldn't give it to us in the fantasy playoffs, but just realized wasn't a complete waste for Fields, at least showing us that he does have that upside in fantasy land. Now, Dwayne, with the Vikings, I don't Just know what quick, they're going to do. I don't, I, don't, yeah. I don't think Fields is – I don't think his ADP – if it even comes out that low, I don't think it'll hold just because people are just so sharp now. Like, you know, I mean, we saw what happened last year with Jalen Hurts, how high he pushed up. and He did end up being a reasonable uh, target. Right. You know, we talked about that. Um, but I, I think you'll end up seeing fields. I think people will be like, you know, he's basically the same thing as Trey Lance. Like, why are we there shouldn't be that much room between them. My guess is fields will end up more like around, you know, QB 14, QB 15. That sounds right. But a man could dream to win. You can dream. I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't be dashing these dreams like so early. Like why? I should wait. Hey, Kirk right. Cousins gets a five hundred thousand dollar bonus for a Super Bowl Super Bowl win, but well, that's gone. <laughs> Rub it in anymore. You have anything else to add? No, um, no. Yeah, as far as the Vikings go, like just keep an eye on it. Um, I, I, you know, it does sound like the starters are going to play, but Dalvin Cook's got a nice matchup. Uh, running back strength of schedule is an eight point five out of ten. You know, against the Bears, um, offensive line run blocking adva- advantage is a sixty, which is going to be in the top five for the week. So Dalvin Cook, as long as we know that he's going to play, remember he's battled through the shoulder injury which he's done in the past so there's a slight chance here i would just keep an eye on it that they decide you know do they just shut cook down if i were leading the team personally i would i just look there aren't any incentives for cook like that really make this game one that he should be playing now justin jefferson on the other hand is a player that's been healthy um you aren't really worried about injury with him uh, you know knock on wood we don't want anything to ha- happen to you know probably our number two i was the highest on him this preseason in in our ranks i went back and looked um so i had jefferson inside i think i had him at 10 or so nine somewhere around there um man I don't know where Yankee has him. I haven't got to look at his top 250, but Justin Jefferson's in my top three for sure. Like I think it's Cooper Cup one, Justin Jefferson two, and then I'm torn between Tyreek Hill, honestly, and Jamar Chase. Like that's where I'm at. Like those, those I think those are. So let's just make that the top four. I'm thinking what those if, guys. What if, what are if Kirk's my, gone? What if Kirk's gone? 
Well, yeah, that's going to impact things, but I think Kirk's back. Yeah, I would think so as well. They would need to trade him. There's absolutely no way they could release him. And no, nor would I think they would want to just straight up. Yeah, it'd be him. a dead cap. Yeah, but it's 45 yeah. mil. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> safe to say that's not going to be happening. <laughs> yeah, but for Jeff for Jefferson, um, six point three out of ten on the wide on the wide receiver strength of schedule, ninety four point seven wide receiver cornerback matchup. You know these guys that like I look. We've been doing the podcast all year, and I still can't name the Bears freaking um, cornerbacks. So <laughs> I mean, that's what we're talking about here. Um, so with Jefferson, you're going to fire him up as usual. Again, just keep an eye on Dalvin Cook before you get him in into any type of lineup. Titans at the Texans, Tennessee, 10-point faves. You know, kind of telling the number one seed is only a 10-point favorite over the Texans in a must-win game, but that's what the Titans are looking at right now. Game total at 43. Derrick Henry practice window has been activated. Dwayne, if the Titans can pull this one off, get that one seed, they could be exiting their bye with healthy versions of Henry, AJB, and Julio. Don't look now, sneaky contender. And by sneaky, I mean they're the number one seed. But we all look at this. Yeah, is Mike like, how's he not? He has to be coach of the year, right? He's fucking up there. I mean, dude, like the number one seed with everything he's dealt with, yeah. no Derrick Henry, A.J. Brown in and out of the lineup. Julio Jones has been out. Tannehill, I mean, because of all that, being pretty mid the whole year. Yeah, it's just I know he had some bad losses, but again, the Titans have had some really good wins against quality yeah. opponents. Um, I know this isn't college football, and that's not how we <laughs> settle everything besides tiebreakers. But man, I I just don't see. And man, just what like Rabel has done? Like, I mean, what he's done with the Titans since he's gotten there? Like, I think it's just I think it's pretty great. Like, I think they've got a good coach. I know he gets I know he gets knocked around for certain things, but I think you know if you look at the win loss you know record since he's been there and before what it was before he got there. I think most Titan fans are very, very happy to have Mike Rabel as their head coach. But yeah, they all you got to do is win and you got the number one seed. So, I mean, if they get that, like you mentioned, they get the bye week, they get home field advantage through all the playoffs. Um, they've got a pretty good home field advantage there. Um, they could they could back in technically and not even have to win. Um, they would need New England and Buffalo uh, to both lose, though, and you would need the Chiefs to lose. You would already know that because that's Saturday, but New England and Buffalo both play in the late games, and they play in the 1 o'clock slate, so they won't know. They'll, they'll, they'll just have to take care of business. So I do 100% trust all of the starters for the Texans. Now They're sorry for the Titans. Yeah. I don't trust any Texans. I'll talk about them in a minute. <laughs> now, some unfortunate news for the Titans. <sighs> A.J. Brown does not care about your fantasy team. He made that very clear on Instagram, sent out a nice post of him and Ryan Tannehill. He said, wouldn't be me without Big Bro. Had some Batman and Robin pictures. Just truly some inspirational yeah. stuff. Most, most boom bust players don't like fantasy because they, <laughs> they can't ride the waves of, of like. And look, folks, if you're the ones out there adding these players, just stop. Yeah, like, seriously. Don't, don't bitch at players when they have a bad fantasy game. Like, it's just terrible form on your part. Don't just don't at them like, yeah, if look, you want to say gonna, something, whatever, yeah. and they want to go search for that. But definitely don't. Yeah. Put don't. Yeah. Don't at them. That's all. Like there, there are some Michael Thomases of the world who you can tell do search their names and go look at each and everything. You know, can't do much about that. I think you got to have a hard skin at some point with that. But yeah, if they're at you, come on, people. But yes, it was just funny to see AJ Brown's response. I don't care about your fantasy, bro. We ran the ball and won. Shut up after your fantasy team. And hey, that's just life when you can run up the score on teams and Ryan Tanner only throws the ball 18 times. So I think as weird as this is, man, probably the safest Titan in this game is none other than Deontay Foreman. This is a bottom five defense in PPR points per game. Allowed to RBs, Titans again are 10 point favorites and touches since week 12, man, 20, 15, 24, nine in a game against the 49ers where they were having to be in comeback mode a lot. And then 26 last week. So RB 21, 15, 11, 37, and 13 during that span. Like it's basically like, you know, a lower middle class version spot of what Jonathan Taylor has this week. That's what we're looking at a with Deontay Foreman. <laughs> yes, that's basically what we have here. And hey, man, you know, with Cam Akers, who we'll talk about a little more later, I think it is pretty nice to see Deontay Foreman also suffer an early career Achilles injury and come back and be a very productive version of himself. Not saying he's better than he was before the injury or any of that, but hey, the guy's going out there. He's had over 100 yards in three straight in three of his last five games. Doesn't happen by accident. So, you know, one of the more under the radar, like feel good comeback stories 
numbers of the year has been Deontay Foreman. And he's in a good spot to put up some numbers again. Just seven offenses are implied to score at least 25 points this week. Colts, Bills, Chiefs, Cardinals, the Titans, Chargers, and the Cowboys. So anytime we can expose ourselves to these offenses, probably a good idea in fantasy. Joanne, you got the Jaguars before? <laughs> You're the Texans, man. Go yeah, on. I, re- I really appreciate this. At least I got to talk about the playoff scenario. Um, yeah. So look here. Let's talk about this. Just do a positive. Like here. I mean, really, it's just all about Brandon Cooks. You know, um, came out and posted a wide receiver 13 finish, and that was after COVID, right? A lot of these players that we've seen miss with COVID have struggled. You know, when they've come back. Now he did have a full week off, right? He missed a game for it. Um, where we've really seen the huge issues of the guys that get it early in the week and then they play, you know, that weekend because the viral load is lower than what it has to be. So they can, you know, but it doesn't even matter now. Like that's all gone. But um, as far as the Texans go, um, it's just not a good matchup, though, for uh, Cooks. If you look at it, it's a 65.2, which is average for wide receiver cornerback matchup. It's a five and a half on the wide receiver strength of schedule, but only 31 points a game given up by Tennessee to opposing receivers over the last six weeks. But you're going to probably see somewhere between eight and 10 targets, you know, to Brandon Cook. So I still think he's a low end wide receiver too, despite the matchup not being that great. Rex Burkhead has operated. I wouldn't call an every down back and he's whatever one notch below near every down back is, you know, so there's every down back, there's near every down back. And then there's one below that before you're like in a true 50, 50 split. Like he's in that range where you're getting between 55, 60% of the work. Um, It is a minus nine on the offensive line run blocking advantage though. Um, And only 16.2 points given up um, by the uh, Titans defense to opposing running backs over the last six contests. So Rex Burkhead, really more of a fade. Shout out to Brandon Cooks, man. The dude has now had six career seasons where he's played at least 15 games, over a thousand yards in each and every single one of them. You know, would like to see him maybe not waste uh, the last, you know, five or so years of his career in Houston. We will see what is on the horizon for him in 2022 and beyond. Saints at the Falcons, New Orleans, four and a half point favorites game total at a lowly 40, which has been the case uh, really for a lot of these Saints games in recent memory. So, Dwayne, there is a scenario where we have to watch Taysom freaking Hill start a playoff game. How could that happen? Yeah. So if you get a situation where, number one, the Saints have to win, right? And then you need a San Francisco loss, which is possible. They play the Rams. So, I mean, really, like this one isn't is such a long shot like what we talked about with the Ravens, right? It's, it's pretty simple. They got to just win their game, which is on Sunday in the late window at 425. Um, San Francisco also plays in the late window. So they're going to have to be geared up. They're going to have to be ready to go win the game. So I think you can 100% trust these starters for asterisks, like what they're worth, which isn't much. And Ian can fill you in on that. <laughs> Dude, it's been so bad. Like I'm just pure offensive total yards over the past three weeks, 212, 164 and 280. They had 190 against the Bills a few weeks before that. Like this has been brutal for the better part of the past six weeks. I mean, the fact Jameis was able to kind of give this offense the upside he did, man. After Jameis has gotten hurt, I think his stock has like only gone up because you still see him really showing up in a lot of these advanced stats of having a good year. And then to see Taysom, Ian Book, all these guys just struggle the way they have uh, truly has been nauseating for stretches. But hey, what helps win fantasy championships, fantasy matchups, rushing quarterbacks? That's what and that's what Taysom Hill continues to be. Now he has had back-to-back starts outside of fantasy's top 12 quarterbacks. He started off his career with six straight. With that said, QB 26 performance against the Buccaneers, we all saw coming. And last week he was still with QB 13, so hardly a com- complete dud there. Atlanta bottom four defensive fantasy points for game to QB. Third most rushing yards allowed to the position. Last year, Taysom against his very defense ripped off QB 3 and QB 7 performances. So at least 11 carries in every start. We've seen how it takes away Kamara's ceiling. It's unfortunate with that said would hardly be shocking if he puts up big numbers again so you know out there in dfs land i will certainly have some lines with Taysom, and do not feel like you need to stack him with anybody in fact please don't stack him with anybody just realize you know quarterbacks getting 10 to 15 carries per week awfully rare just need to find the end zone once maybe even twice to really help blow up the slate Dwayne on the falcons I just wish they would give my guy Cordero Patterson the ball more. That's all. And, you know, you can say whatever you want to say about them, but that's all I have to say. Yeah, don't stack the game. Don't stack Taysom Hill and don't bring it back. 
Yes. <laughs> the the That's the one guy. The one guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're just going Taysom naked if you're going with this game at all. Uh, well, Patterson, it's just a tough matchup, man. Running back strength of schedule is a 1.1 yeah. out of a scale from 0 to 10. So really tough. Offensive line run blocking advantage is also well below average at only a 22. 19 points uh, allowed per game over the last six by New Orleans, two opposing running backs in the PPR. Patterson, man, like, went from, you know, really being the goat of the first half of the season to just struggling more over the second half. I think it goes back to the high ankle sprain in. I think it goes back to getting him back so quickly from that because at the time they were still in contention. And I think now they're just kind of letting him rest it and they're just not pushing it anymore. Um, you know, he's splitting the backfield with Mike Davis, but over the last three games, you've got RB finishes of 57, 33 and 36. So Patterson is a guy that you just got to stay away from right now when you get the matchup and you know, the saints are just, they've got a lot to play for. So I just don't see a reason to have any of these guys near your lineup. Russell Gage is a very interesting guy. I want to watch over the off season. Ian, you know, so he could be landing and he could land in another town. And I think he's shown enough, you know, his targets per route run, you know, against man, against zone have, been, have both been up there. I think he's shown, you know, also in our advanced, you know, data where we track all the routes that have been run. Like he surprised me at how often he's able to get open against press man, against single man coverage. He's been really up there kind of similar to Keenan Allen. And at first it was a small sample size. And as the sample size has gotten larger and larger and larger, like he just keeps hanging out up there. So I think Russell Gage probably has more to his game than what we originally thought. You know, he's not quite doing what Amon Ross St. Brown, you know, is, you know, he started kind of on that same, same wavelength. And then he's just kind of died off here over the last couple of games, but his target shares have still been really good. They've still been up over 20%. So he's getting, he's at least, you know, the, the quarterback is dropping back and is not afraid to throw the ball to Russell Gage, quarterback being Matt Ryan, uh, who, man, God, like he looks like he's really approaching Big Ben territory really quickly. Yeah. Last thing I'll mention, I know I'm only doing one point on most of these teams, but on this one, I just had a, even though it's, I know the, the, the Falcons suck, but they're one of these teams, Ian, like, I know they suck, but like they've got some weapons. Like, I feel like they're close to being an offense that can be decent. And I think Arthur Smith did a nice job with them. But the last note that I'll leave you with is really just around Kyle Pitts. Um, we'll see if he can play. He got knocked out of the game last week with a hamstring injury, so he could be out this week. But if he can get out there and go, he needs 59 yards for the single season uh, rookie tight end record from Mike, Mike Ditka, uh, 1961. I'd throw my air quotes up there for the rookie tight end record uh, for you YouTube listeners out there. Maybe you caught that, but particularly <laughs> with Gage, man, like Gage, his performance has been impressive. Like if you, I totally understand any of you listeners out there haven't gone out of your way to watch Falcons games this year, but as long as Gage is not trying to hurdle someone, he has really looked like maybe not one of the league's better receivers, but a legit talent at the position. This has not just been, you know, volume after volume. That's the only reason why he's been winning. So shout out to Gage on a very good 2021 season. Yeah. I see. I honestly like you and I are opposite on this. Like, I think what Kyle Pitts is doing, I think Kyle Pitts is a tight end. I know he's been playing outside, but a lot of it's based on they've got Hayden Hurst. They've got these other guys. Like, to me, it's more impressive to be able to do what he's done against outside coverage with corners and safeties versus rather than linebackers and safeties. So it's like to me, it's like it's almost more of a hat tip to Kyle Pitts that he's been able to do what he's doing, um, despite the fact he's playing outside. And he really is. You know, he was drafted as a tight end. Agree or disagree, Dwayne? Seahawks at the Cardinals. <laughs> Arizona, six and a half point favorites. Game total at 48. Arizona coming off that, you know, it, it seemed like after those couple losses that they were potentially ready to tailspin straight into the playoffs. Obviously, turn the boat around, ship around, whatever the hell kind of thing I'm trying to say here against the Cowboys. So, Dwayne, this is a situation where they are going to want to try to rip off another win. It can't help them quite a bit here in the old playoff seating. Yeah, they're in. Um, but if they win... And you get a Rams loss, you move into the division lead, which means now you move from playing a road game to you could actually be playing a home game. So they could move inside the top four seeds. They're not going to get, you know, the one seed, but they could climb. They could climb into the top four and they get a home game in that first game. And the Rams play in the late game in the late win in the late window. So it's at the same time that they're playing. So it will be a situation where they won't know they're going to have to keep playing. You could see a potential thing where if all of a sudden the Rams are like blowing the 49ers out in the, you know, in the third or fourth quarter, 50 to nothing you know, and they're winning. Maybe they rest some players late in the game, but I think overall you're going to see most of the starters for the Cardinals, assuming, you know, all the ones that are healthy, we're going to have questions around the backs, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but I think you'll see them all play. 
Dwayne, DK Metcalf this year has 70 catches for 909 yards and 12 touchdowns. Yeah. That's like a really good line. <laughs> I know. I can't believe and, it. And you feel like it's been unusable. Like, look, most of the spike week stuff, like the ups and downs, you don't really care about. Like, if you're trying to say, hey, I'm drafting a player that's more consistent, for the most part, that's all BS. But there are always outlier cases each year that – truly do fit the mold of you're like, wow, I have this player that's going to finish up like whatever in the top 12. And I felt scared to start him every week. And that's the, that's the book. That's the book that DK Metcalf's name is written in this year. Obviously three touchdowns last week helped also shout out. He had a wildly entertaining field goal return. Didn't go for a score or anything, but it just kind of showed how freaky of an athlete he is. You know what you have with DK, you know, what you have with Lockett. I'm just not confident that we're going to get the best version of Russell Wilson against a non Detroit Lions defense. So really in this one feels weird to say, man, sign of the, how weird the times are most, uh, I think consistent guy we can trust in the Seahawks offense right now is none other than Rashad Penny. This is one of, only eight backfields on the week with a combined explosive run play rate of at least 11 percent that is good and in the last four games rb3 rb42 when he was banged up on just 24 snaps most recently rb9 and rb1 when you all needed it most in those fantasy championships so yes cardinals top six defense and fantasy points per game allowed to opposing running backs i know they have a lot more to play for in this one but volume is volume and if we end up seeing some of these you know ownership projections go out there later in the week guys like penny that we're expecting to see 20 plus touches and more game scripts than not those are the types of guys in tournaments that you should be taking an awfully long look at and you know if you are going to completely fade them better have a pretty good reason to do so now, Dwayne, with the Cardinals, it's now been, you know, a handful of weeks here since DeAndre Hopkins has left the picture. We've still seen Kyler spread the ball out to an extent, but we have started to see some guys, Zach Ertz, Antoine Wesley coming off a good week, particularly Christian Kirk, lead the way. Yeah. Yeah. I think the big question really with the Cardinals this weekend is what's going to happen with the backs. Cause we saw Chase Edmonds get knocked out of that game briefly. You know, he did come back in to play. We've been without James Conner. Um, you know, the matchup isn't, you know, it's okay against Seattle, you know, as far as just the true matchup itself. But whenever you talk about getting to play, um, you know, against the Seahawks, like, oh, what am I doing? Like, why am I saying, what do I got the, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So i uh, sorry. I was looking at the wrong thing, but when we talk about getting to play against the Seahawks, it's all a matter of like, you know, how many running rushing attempts, you know, the Seahawks are giving up in regulation per game. And Chase Edmonds is in a great spot from that standpoint. Um, they're giving up 28.1 on the season, which is the fifth most. So the, all I did is just exclude overtime to kind of make everything equal. So the best in the league is like uh, 29.2, like is the top one. And so, it, or sorry, 29.3 and they're at 28.1. So good situation for the backfield. If we get one guy or the other, man, I am not trusting the James Conner thing. I don't look, I don't trust Cliff Kingsbury at all when it comes to injuries. Like, you know, there could be a guy that's going to be out. For, he's he's worse than Pete Carroll. Like, there could be a player that's going to be out for two years, and he would game still time call decision. him. He's going to call him a game time decision, like every single week. And last week, you know, people got a little fooled because, like, okay, limited practice at the end week, end of the week for James Conner. Maybe we will see him. I don't trust it right now. I'm going to assume that really all we're going to see in this game is going to be Chase Edmonds. So if you take that data point I just gave you and how many rushing attempts the Seahawks allow, you know, per game, but mostly because they suck and they trail most of the time, didn't so much last week. Edmonds is going to be inside the top 10 you know for me and running backs this week probably top five if 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 i know that james connor is out right now i've got him sitting around uh running back eight and then yeah you mentioned look well, just with kirk and with uh Ertz, i'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it but both of them have seen more volume over the last several weeks with deandre hopkins out 86.9 wide receiver cornerback matchup this week for christian kirk which is really good so he'll be borderline wide receiver two for me probably high end wide receiver three um, and then as far as Ertz goes, he's also got a nice matchup and it's a 7.7 out of 10 on the tight end strength of schedule, 14.3 points per game in a PPR format allowed by Seattle to the opposing tight ends over the last six games. Jets at the Bills, Buffalo 16 and a half point favorites. Game total is at 41 and a half. Now, we saw last week what a little bit of snow can do to a passing game. Obviously, it didn't go that well for Josh and company despite getting that win. And that is a possibility. Again, handy dandy Google weather in Buffalo on Sunday, looking at 37% precipitation and 20 mile, mile per hour winds at 1 p.m. So, Dwayne, we'll need to monitor the weather. It does seem like Josh Allen and company should be out there for the majority of the game, though. Yeah. Um, 
looking at the playoff situation, I mean, it's one where if they win, they win the division. Obviously, the Patriots are if would be there to scoop it up if for some reason we did see the Bills fall to the Jets. And I mean, look, the Jets did hang in there last week with the Bucks. We, no, we, no one expected the Jets to jump out on the Bucks like they did last week. Now, I think it's. I'll, it's a lock, basically, that the Bills are going to win this game. But, you know, it's just something worth watching. But so, but they have enough to – they've got a reason to play. Like, they're going to have to play. they got to win. They can't let up any at all because they've got New England right there behind them. So, I do believe you can trust 100% uh, you know, confidence in the starters for all of the Bills players. I don't think there's a single Jets player you can trust because Braxton Berrios is not practicing with a quad. Jameson Crowder returned to practice anyway, which would mess that up. And our guy, Michael Carter, is also out with a concussion. So, yeah. Have they already really ruled wanna... him out or he just didn't practice? He just didn't practice. So, okay. like, you really want to sign up for any of these guys on the road against a motivated Buffalo team in a bad weather game. Could not be me. I do want to give a little shout-out to Michael Carter, though, because he impressed, man. I know Javante Williams was getting a lot of the sexy headlines with the missed tackles for per carry and everything, but he was right up there as well. Really, you know, I, I made a little graph. Missed tackles for per carry and yards after contact per carry, and it gave us, like, a good seven, eight running backs up in the top right of guys that are basically top eight or so in each of these categories so nick chubb javante williams devin singletary tony pollard aaron jones ramondre stevenson and michael carter so tevin coleman is also off the covid list so even if carter manages to play this is not going to be a good spot for him but one of those guys where if we see coleman not return next year ty johnson you know someone that carter's already beat out Austin walter it's a soft depth chart and an offense that has nowhere to go but up and even if they stay shitty michael carter i think has a, you know carved out enough of a cemented role, particularly once Coleman's out of the picture, where he's going to be, you know, one of those RB2 targets that I think a lot of people, maybe rightfully so, are going to be talking themselves into during this offseason. Now, Dwayne, I did mention Devin Singletary there as one of those guys that has been impressing in terms of some of these broken tackle metrics. He's also had the workload to boot over these last four or five weeks. I know last week you came in and surprised me at first. I think you had Singletary RB11 or RB12. He was really far up there. Came through and he has been doing, coming through You know, recently. How high are you on Singletary in the Bills run game this week? Uh, yeah, right now I've got Singletary as my RB7 on the week. Ooh. I mean, like it's – look, it's the 16.5 point spread like you mentioned. A lot to play for like you mentioned. 29.25 implied points like you mentioned. You get an 8.3 running back strength of schedule out of 10. Um, so that's going to be in the top five for the week. Offensive line run blocking advantage of 53. Defensive points allowed um, or to the running back position by the Jets over the last six games, 26.7. And then if you look at, you know, how many rushing attempts just the Jets are giving up, you know, each game in regulation only, they are over the last six weeks giving up 31.7 rushing attempts per game, most in the league. On the season, they're giving up 29.2, which is the second most in the league. I I think this is a smash spot for Devin Singletary. Yes, I loved him last week. Um, not very many people were on him in DFS. DFS. It, like, it, it really what made my day because I didn't have enough Jamar Chase exposure. But he just, you know, you're trying to win the big stuff in a tournament. But he saved me and made a lot of things cash. <laughs> just having Singletary in so many lineups. Um, and he was sub 10% owned um, in most of the stuff that I was in. So, yeah, I think he'll be high. I think his um, roster ship will be higher this week. But I think he's an absolute smash spot. Um, if you look at him um, over the last three games, like the utilization backs all this up as well. Like this isn't something where it's just, um, you know, oh, he just had a couple of touchdowns or whatever. If you look at it, his snaps, 93%, 68%, 80%. And this is the second game in a row where we've had Zach Moss active. And so Zach Moss in the last two games, 11% of the rushing attempts and 13%. And if you look at it for Singletary, 44% and 58%. Really, Josh Allen is the RB2, the RB1 is Singletary. Zach Moss just comes in, gives you a breather, two to three drives a game, but he's really not out there that much. All the passing down work going to Singletary so you can trust him. Panthers at the Buccaneers. Tampa Bay, eight-point favorites. Game total at 41 and a half. Bruce Arians has already come out and said, we're not resting anybody, and said, you play to win the game as Herman Edwards once told us all. So, Dwayne, does seem like Tampa Bay, even though they can't get that one seed, they do have a chance to get the two seed, and that would give them home field advantage, at least for the first two rounds of the postseason. Not a guarantee, and this is maybe one of those teams where, you know, we'll keep it especially, especially close eye on the injury report, banged out guys maybe not out there, but more snaps than not, we should be seeing Tom Brady and company out there. 
Yeah, I mean, they can get to that two seed. We talked about it a second ago. That means you get home filled until you, if if the Packers make it all the way, right, to the championship round, um, then in that situation, like, you would have to travel to the Packers. But if the Packers don't make it, then, like, you get home filled for the whole playoff. So I, I believe Arians on this. Um, it is a late window game, so they can't just scoreboard watch in the early window and see if the Rams lose or not, decide what they want to do, like they're going to both be playing at the same time. So I have this one at 75% trust. I, you know, the only reason is just because I think they've got players that are dealing with health issues, um, and I could see them play and then be pulled out of the game a little bit earlier, especially if they're coasting and it's an easy matchup against the Panthers where, I mean, they could be up by, you know, now look, this is a team that had to play it close. Anything can happen in the NFL in any given week. We saw the Bucs barely beat the Jets last week. You know, this isn't the same Bucs that we saw five, six weeks ago with Antonio Brown now gone. And you already know that Chris Godwin is out for the season. So it's a, it's a much more condensed passing attack. Leonard Fournette is also missing. So I just think it's something late in the game if they want to protect a player like Evans or if Rojo does go. Like, I don't think he carries quite as much upside to close things out in the fourth quarter, right? I could see them being like, okay, you're good. You came out here and gutted it out. Now let's get you out of there in the third quarter. We're winning the game. AV's not gone yet, Join. Yeah, Field he's not. Just said, but but, no more but Arians moves. has already said, he said, look, it's just, look, it's like a technicality. Thing. Arians said he wasn't going to be on the team in the first place. Yeah, I know. He's just said he's still gone. He said it's just, it's just a, it's a, a matter of managing we'll through the process. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see, man. Dude, you got to admit. Like so the they're going to let people, go of Arians and keep AB. A, the amount of people that would be so furious if AB comes back in the playoffs and just balls the hell out for four straight rounds, like th- that would be objectively funny. Yeah. Is there anything that they could be doing just to try to keep him off another team? I think if I had to guess, that could be part of it. But I think they're probably – I think AB's camp is trying to say he was hurt so they can get well, enough, yeah, as much money as possible. Saying, yeah. So I think that's the primary holdup. But anyway – Largely unlikely AB storylines away. I want to talk about a wide receiver on the Carolina Panthers who has not had as fancy friendly opportunities this year. And that is one DJ Moore. 30 incomplete targets thrown his way this year that PFF deemed to be the quarterback's fault. Easily the most in the league. Dwayne, I'll do this article again probably in later February or March. But like last year, I looked at the most unlucky receivers in the NFL based on uncatchable passes and things like that. And it was DJ Moore and Jerry Judy. So now, you know, DJ just gets Sam Darnold and same old stuff. So just very sad. You can all go to my Twitter. And I actually clipped 73 seconds worth of examples of Darnold and other Panthers quarterbacks quarterbacks missing an open DJ Moore dude turns 25 in April and has three straight thousand yard years free DJ Moore fun storyline to keep up with though we don't have the Alvin Alvin Kamara 81 catches thing going for us anymore but we do have the DJ Moore exactly 1215 yards from scrimmage and four touchdowns still on the table shout out to another uh, great Twitter account uh, Russell Clay at Russell J Clay for originally bringing this to my attention in the offseason but yes if DJ Moore gets 110 total scoreless yards this week that would be his third straight year with exactly 1215 yards from scrimmage and four touchdowns does this matter no but like that's crazy man and it shows that we are living in a simulation so that's just where my head's at here in week 18 do want to point out though that you know with dj and with robbie anderson these are guys that really i think are on par with the denver weapons in terms of we can see their ceilings just increase so much this offseason if one of rogers russ maybe even deshaun watson finds a way to carolina dj and robbie number one and number two among all skill position players and fantasy points below expectation this year We just saw them in 2020 with Teddy. Look great, man. Both go for over a 1,000 yards. Both be good more weeks than not. I think this is a situation where it's pretty clear who is causing that issue, and it is not the wide receivers. So, you know, this year against Tampa, maybe you want to try to talk yourself into, uh, you know, the Buccaneers forcing teams to pass and everything. But that was really more of a first-month storyline than anything. Offenses hit four of their top five largest passing yard totals against Tampa Bay during the first first four weeks of the year. They've been much better sense and before i throw it to you Dwayne, just want to bring up i think my favorite defensive stat i saw it used a lot in the college football circles but you can easily apply it to the havoc. nfl as well it is havoc tackles for a loss or no gain forced fumbles cool. interceptions yeah it sounds great man 
Tackles for a loss or no gain, forced fumbles, interceptions, pass breakups, and pressures divided by plays. Number one defense in the league by a good amount, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Dolphins, Bills, Packers, and Cowboys round out your top five. Bottom five defenses, Vikings, Seahawks, Chargers, Lions, and the Falcons. So not expecting uh, this to be a good day for the Carolina Panthers offense. Yeah, DJ Moore, you know, if you're feeling like just praying the fantasy gods for a big game, but I will probably have zero exposure to any Panthers in DFS land come Sunday. Dwayne, that with the Buccaneers, assuming Antonio Brown is not out there, we do have a uh, pass funnel situation to Mike Evans and Rob Gronkowski in a game that they should be out there most of the time. Yeah, the Bucs, you know, it's an interesting one um, because really over the last two games, and they've had two very different game scripts, um, one where they were leading more, one where they trailed almost the whole time. But in both games, they actually threw the ball um, a lot less than what they had been doing, you know, because we had seen them be a, a, a team that no matter what game scenario, they were throwing the ball above the NFL average and it's still above the NFL average, but it's coming much closer to the NFL averages. So I think you're seeing an adaptation of the offense based on the fact that they're dealing with life um, without Chris Godwin. And now you're going to have it, you know, with Antonio Brown as well. Also, the backfield's completely banged up. Rojo got knocked out of the game last week. We'll see what happens with him. He didn't practice today. Um, Keyshawn Vaughn was also banged up in the game, but he did return to practice today. So if we have a situation where Rojo is out and you've got Keyshawn Vaughn active and you've got Le'Veon Bell really as the other option, I expect to see Keyshawn mostly basically take over Ronald Jones's role. Right. And I think Le'Veon Bell would take over the role that Vaughn was splitting last week um, before Rojo got hurt, which was basically the passing down stuff. Um, so I think you'd probably see Keyshawn Vaughn somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of the rushing attempts, maybe 30, 40 percent of the routes. And I think you see the rest of the routes go over to Le'Veon Bell. I don't think you'll get a lot out on the ground out of Bell, and, unless for some reason, you know, Vaughn ends up not playing, too. And then wouldn't that be crazy if you got a Le'Veon Bell throwback game, you know, where he just <laughs> comes out here and gets, you know, 35 touches in a game? That would be pretty hilarious. Look, he. We, we know that he knows what to do in the passing game. We're not saying he's still explosive. So I think there's some positive traits there for Love Bell, just as far as can Brady trust him? Maybe. You know, I think that's a possibility, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, you mentioned the funnel. Yeah, it's all about Mike Evans, all about Rob Gronkowski. Look, Mike Evans, you know, on the season, you know, is sitting inside, you know, the top 12 receivers, and he hasn't even had, you know, six, he's had 17%, you know, or 16% of the Bucks targets on the year. And so now I think you're going to you're going to see that number more like 25 percent, 30 percent every week from now through the playoffs. It's an 85.7 uh, wide receiver cornerback matchup. It's a it's a, a 6.4 out of 10 on the wide receiver strength of schedule. So it's a good spot for Evans and also for Gronkowski, who has the best tight end matchup on the slate of a 61. And don't be discounting Tom Brady just really trying to put a nail, you know, in that MVP argument. It does seem like, you know, Rodgers is a favorite and, you know, maybe deservingly yeah, so. I agree. But, yeah, fun note from uh, PFF's own at PFF underscore Steve. Steve Palazzola, in terms of PFF's just war, which is one of our cool metrics we've come up with over the years, Tom Brady is number one at 4.7. Joe Burrow, number two. Rodgers, number three. And again, some of the cool stats that Steve brings up on his Twitter. Brady leads the league with 40 passing touchdowns, and he's had a league-high eight passes dropped in the end zone. Uh, you know, if you want to look at like those MVP moments, he okay, he had the walk-off um, overtime touchdown drive against the Bills and then last week's 93 yard drive where he had the game one with Cyril Grayson and man like he should have had the game winning touchdown to Antonio Brown against the Patriots unfortunately AB couldn't hang on to it there was a lot of rain going on but yeah truly you know whether Rodgers wins it or not the fact Brady just put up the season at 44 years old truly some remarkable yeah. stuff Brady does have another 1.2 million in incentives that he could reach I think really only 562,000 of it's reasonable and that's to be in the top five in passer rating Kirk Cousins is Kirk Cousins is fifth right now at 101.3. Brady's at 100.8. So I think that one's achievable if you come out and you really have a great game. Um, the other one is top five in completion percentage or in yards per attempt. He's he's pretty well behind the lead between behind the leaders in each of those categories. So I don't think you know he can reach either of those. But hey, I mean Brady's got enough money. But like I mean half I was a about mil, to say, half, half, a, a, half a mil is still half a mil. I would think so, man. But like, is half a million to Brady like five thousand to us? Like, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, dude, it's probably less. It's yeah. probably it's probably like five bucks to us. Man. Oh my god! <laughs> With all the stuff he has going, like, I don't know what Brady's worth, uh, but it's probably less than five thousand to you and me. 
<laughs> oh man, gotta love this game. We, look, he, he's got an incentive that we would love to be our annual salary. Five sixty two. There we go. <laughs> Patriots at the Dolphins, New England six and a half point favorites. Game total at 40. Dwayne, pretty much what you were talking about, the Bills also applies to the Patriots here. They need to try to win this football game. Yeah, yeah. The Patriots have got to go all in this weekend. Look, they're in the playoffs. So it doesn't like they're not going to do anything to to hurt themselves to be knocked out. Like they're in. But if you get a situation where you get the loss, um, from Buffalo and they get the win, then they are the number one seed. Um, if they, sorry, not the number one seed group, they would, they would move into the number one. They would win the division. Sorry. But if they get Buffalo, Tennessee and Kansas city losses, then they could actually move to the number one seed. So there is a, there's a crazy scenario where New England could still get the first seed. Very, very, very unlikely, but I do believe that you can trust all the starters for the Patriots. They've got enough reason to be playing. You know, Dwayne, I heard your dogs bark, so I decided to bark. I, I like to bark during the course of my life. PFF Lily was just looking at me. Uh, but, you know, watching the games at the PFF offices this year, uh, Trevor Sycamore was almost always there um, with me and Eric and, you know, the rest of the guys that we usually do in the Sunday show. And, like, week seven comes by, and I liked, I usually let a bark out. There's, like, a big hit or something on the field, and Trevor's just like, dude, like, is the barking thing, like, a bit? Like, what's that about? <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, uh, no, I'm just kind of a weird guy, I guess, with that. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. You spend so much time in front of this computer screen, certain moments like that. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, you're like freaking weirdo sometimes, man. So, oh, well, back to uh, the matter at hand. Patriots, you know, at this point, I think we can just basically trust the run game. And that is about it. Keep an eye on Damien Harris and that hamstring. But he has been healthy enough over his past four games to turn in performances at the RB21 or better. We just know that between him and Stevenson, it's going to be really tough to figure out which one's going to have the more productive week and then we got brandon bolden bolden behind them just unfortunately lowering the ceiling and floor for everyone involved either way though man 11 of 16 games this year this patriots backfield has enabled at least one top 24 back if we do get a situation next year where maybe harris is out of the picture the patriots are comfortable enough with stevenson to lean on him as early down guy that's i think where we get one of those like garrett blunt s seasons where we actually see a patriots running back pushing for 300 carries but as things as things stand right now tough to treat either guys much more than a borderline rb2 kind of in the same vein as those broncos running back so this is a bottom five passing volume offense and non-garbage time. Patriots, Colts, 49ers, Eagles, and Titans are notching those. Just realize that, again, it's going to be always tough to tell the difference between us, Harris and Stevenson during any given weekend. I mentioned the Havoc stat right there behind Tampa Bay Buccaneers at number two is the Miami Dolphins. So Miami, you know, obviously had to see that win streak snapped. Don't exactly have the same, uh, you know, playoff aspirations on the line this week, but I also don't necessarily expect them to bow down to Bill Belichick and company and make things too easy for this offense again the game total is just at 40 points in this one now Dwayne with Miami we got our guy Jalen Waddle and that is about it these days but even he couldn't produce that much in uh, week 17 talk about uh, you know Waddle and this Dolphins offense and if you care to a little bit moving forward because man we've been talking up Waddle all year long but Dwayne that was when he was going as a freaking almost wide receiver five in ADP if we're going to see potentially a different quarterback in Miami next year which I'm not trying to say this out of hate of two or anything but if we see a different quarterback or we see Fuller and Parker back or or, I don't know, Tua just has more time to throw. I think there's a lot of ways that Waddle could go wrong next year if he's going to be treated as a legit top 12, top 15 receiver. Yeah, I think that's possible. But, like, his draft capital alone, like how high he was drafted in the draft, and then, like, what he's come out and done in his first year suggests that it probably won't be a bust. Like, he could have some regression and still be really good. Like, he's one reception away from 100. He's at 99 on the season. He's 12 yards away from 1,000. He's got five uh, receiving touchdowns. So he's a little bit different than some of these other receivers just because he gets to operate inside more. He gets to operate underneath, right? So it's not as much. Um, we haven't got to see as much. Not that he doesn't have it, but we haven't got to see like that vertical presence where we've really seen with a guy like Jamar Chase, he's winning in every way, right? He can win the contested catch down the field. He can run away and catch a deep ball and just, you know, blow a guy out, you know, and get over the top. He can actually catch a ball underneath and then run after. Obviously, if you watched the play last week where he just went ran away from the whole Chiefs defense, the guy's got another gear. Um, I know he didn't come out and run like a 4-3 or anything in the combine, but it's one of those things when you watch him run away from everyone in that game. It's just, it was, it was a, 
you don't see that kind of play that often where you catch the ball, you're even with all the other defenders, or they've actually got an angle on you. And then you just run away from all of them. <laughs> and like, so Chase is just on another level, but we have seen Waddle get a little bit more explosive over the last several games. Um, so I think that's a positive for him, but I think, yeah, man, look, he's a young receiver. Um, he's going to go high next year. Like my, I haven't, again, I haven't looked at any kind of even early ADPs, but just knowing the way people get about young players that come out and, and rightfully so and perform well right out of the gate, like he's probably a third round pick. That's my guess. Third round pick. I mean, I could see some people maybe take him in the second. I don't know. Uh, but my guess is he lands in the third round um, next year once ADP hits. I could be surprised. It could be a little higher than that. Um, but I think if you get to the third round, like, and, and it'll all make more sense, like, once we've really ranked everybody and you see who else is around him, because that matters. Like, if all this, if you're worried about, like, what you're saying about what you're saying, but then you look around him. And you just see like a bunch of other receivers that, you know, are six, seven, eight years older than him and you feel like have similar floors and upside. Well, then you just go ahead and take the younger player yeah. and Jalen Waddle. So I think some of some of that context will lend itself to how often, you know, we're going to be rostering Jalen Waddle heading into the 2022 season. But, man, it has been so great. I know you were huge on Waddle. He was one of my biggest hits. He was my most rostered player and all my year long stuff. So was my wide receiver four on most of my teams. Um, so really came through in a huge way, like made, made my season. I didn't win any of the big prizes, but made my season very profitable. So I love Jalen Waddle. And, you know, just one of the few guys, man, Ian, whenever you look across the league, you know, he's doing some things. Again, I know he gets to play from the slot, but like whenever you look at Waddle's performance, you know, against man coverage, against zone coverage. So against man, he's 24% of the targets for the Dolphins. Against zone, he's 24%. So this excludes red zone and goal line stuff. So some of you will probably be like, well, wow, his target share is higher than that. Like, so that's why, like, when the numbers don't add up to exactly what you want, but his tar targets per route run versus man, 25%. Targets per route run versus zone, 24%. So he's heavily used across the board in both ways and those aren't elite numbers those aren't like you know 28 to 30 percent like is really like way up there but this is still really strong for a player that's this young like waddle with the draft capital that he has behind him so i still feel very bullish um this week it's a one out of ten on the wide receiver strength of schedule he's got the patriots Sheesh. um 80.9 though on the wide receiver cornerback matchup so waddle has quickly done a good job of really building up his reputation within the pff database that no matter really who he's going against like it's typically positive like he doesn't and you'll see that with the best receivers so if you guys haven't had a chance to check out our wide receiver cornerback matchup tool but like the very best receivers like cooper cup justin jefferson um you know aj brown's up there stefan Diggs. even when they get in a tough matchup you'll still see them be up in the 80s right and you won't see them drop down into the 40s into the 50s you know even though they've got that tougher matchup and so waddle's starting to get into that territory it's an 81 now he does again he gets to play inside not outside so that that helps out a lot but I think that's basically on the Dolphins. Um, you're, you're, unless you want to say something about Duke Johnson. Like, he is the lead back <laughs> in a three-way committee. You can't touch it. You can't mess with it. But it is kind of cool to see Duke Johnson over the last several weeks um, just taking over. And the dead zone is real with Miles Gaskin. Just, it all blew up. Hey, Duke Johnson's an RB1, man. It's something I've always known. I'm happy that uh, one of those football teams is out there willing to do the same. Uh, all good points on Waddle. And I will say that some of the concerns I brought up might not even be concerns. Maybe Fuller does come back and open up the intermediate underneath the areas of the field even more for Waddle. Maybe one of these top potential quarterbacks we're thinking could get traded comes to Miami, elevates the whole offense, and we see Waddle have a Tyreek-esque year two bump in his yards per reception and in his average target depth. So just some questions that we're going to have to hash out and Lord knows we have plenty of months to do so once this season winds up. Last 425 game we're talking about here. 49ers at the Rams. LA sitting as four and a half point favorites. Game total at 44. Dwayne, this is one of these situations where both teams are still firmly in playoff contention and they need to go out there and try to win each and every snap of this one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, looking at the situation, you know, you've got the 49ers um, from their standpoint. If they win, they're in. So it's pretty simple, <laughs> you know, they've just got to go do their thing. Um, if they lose and New Orleans wins, they're out, right? So New Orleans plays late. They won't know um, what's going on with that game. So I think you're going to get, obviously, everything out of the 49ers. If you look at the Rams, they're in the playoffs, but they could drop as low as a five seed if the Cardinals win. And the Cardinals are also playing in the late window. Um, they could also just be jousting for position within the top four, um, even if they keep the division championship or the conference championship. So um, 
So I say, I just messed that whole thing up. Division. Sorry. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, whenever you look at the 40, whenever you look at the Rams, they just got to go out and still win too. So I trust both of these teams 100%, you know, with the Rams, also both teams that are in the mix, you know, as far as like changing their equation, Arizona and Tampa Bay, they both play late. They will know like if Dallas is lost or not, because that's a Saturday game, but I don't think it's going to matter. The Rams are going to want to hold on to the two seed. They're going to want to continue to have home field advantage. And then whenever you got the 49ers again, they just, they have to win. So they got to take care of business. And taking care of business for 49ers this year has meant feeding Elijah Mitchell the football at least 18 touches in eight of his 10 games on the year. League high 205 touches without a drop or fumble. Devontae Freeman at 160 is the only other running back over even 60 such touches. Truly, Mitchell has made the most out of all of his opportunities. He's going to need to keep doing so. This is the third toughest matchup of the week in terms of combined yards before contact per carry. So Aaron Donald, you know, Kind of a down year relative for him. And I still think he has arguably a better case for defensive MVP than just about anyone. That's just how high the freaking ceiling is from this dude when he is right. Uh, the thing with Mitchell, though, and you see this with some of his highlights, you know, the big runs that look, the 49ers, the way Kyle Shannon can scheme things up and the way their offensive line has been playing. I mean, Trent Williams, if we just made MVP like best player and not necessarily most valuable, I think Trent Williams would have as good of a case of anyone. But with Mitchell, yeah, I put a little more respect on his name, I think, as a pure rusher. I mentioned the A.J. Dillon yards after contact, you know, on two-plus yards after contact on at least on 77% of his carries. He's number one, followed by Tony Pollard, Jamal Williams, Joe Mixon, and in fifth place, Elijah Mitchell. So, yes, get some nice runway from that offensive line, the scheme, but he is also regularly dragging defenders at a higher rate than just about anyone out there. So, great year from Mitchell. Expect him to keep getting fed. We'll see if Jimmy G's back. He was practicing in a limited fashion, you know, you know, Trey Lance, I think, did start to show crazy concept, Dwayne. You know, Trey Lance got some more reps out there, started to see him, uh, you know, process things a little bit better, maybe not even throw every single pass at 120 miles per hour, took it down to 110 a couple times out there. Saw, you know, just some stuff to feel good about for the future with him. Wouldn't quite say it was like Mahomes week 17 against the Broncos as a rookie level good, but it was encouraging nonetheless. Uh, we'll see if he's still out there, but if Jimmy G is healthy enough or even 90%, I would think that Shanny's still going to give him the chance to go. So, if Lance is out there, you know, obviously it's going to be slight downgrades to Debo, Ayuk, and Kittle. But with that said, you know, we got Jimmy G playing with a hurt thumb. The last report I heard is like they're still waiting for a part of it to attach back to itself. So doesn't exactly sound like a situation where we should be expecting the best version of Jimmy G that if he's out terrible. there as well. It, it does sound pretty freaking <laughs> We're terrible. For so, it to attach itself back to the appropriate spot. Like, okay. not, uh, not ideal. So Elijah Mitchell, you know, we can trust him. Debo Samuel seems to, you know, just tell regression to F on. Off each and every week and no i wouldn't put it past him to hit a big play at some point but i probably will be fading that idea in dfs land so we know kittle Ayuk, and debo these guys have the potential to put up a lot of numbers but if it's going to be lance or a banged up version of jimmy g under center i just think it's gonna be hard to have any level of confidence in a high touch count for anyone other than mitchell now Dwayne, i mentioned this article before but my number not ranked number one, but the first off-season storyline that came to my mind looking ahead in the 2022 was whether or not Cam Akers could get his job back. Because we've seen, man, from Todd Gurley to C.J. Anderson to Daryl Henderson to Akers himself and now to freaking Sony Michelle, whoever Sean McVay's RB1 is has been a fantasy superstar. Right now, that's Sony Michelle. We'll see how much longer it lasts. Yeah, man. That's a very good one to follow. You know, um, and, and my guess is you're going to see McVay try to have three backs on his, yeah. on his roster. Probably for the first time ever, you know, and actually use him consistently. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think you're no matter what, you're probably going to go into the season where he's got three viable options just because, like, these injuries have happened um, and they continue to happen. He's been through it, like you mentioned, with Gurley. Now he's gone through it, you know, with Akers and only his second season. And then with Daryl Henderson, he's always hurt. So I think, it, it, you know, Henderson, it's almost like you got to count as your three and you need two other guys um, because you just you got to know you have one if the other's hurt. <laughs> Um, as far as just anything on the Rams, you know, we already talked about like they're going to they're going to probably be playing to win, but they've got some other things that they could be playing for as well. If you look at Cooper Cup, 12 more receptions. He will break the single season record. Um, if you look at, you know, receiving yards, 136 receiving yards to break the single season record. Um, and he's 171 away from 2000. So Cooper Cup, like, man, like what a season. <laughs> like I know these I know these things. 
you know, all have an asterisk with them because they're in 17 games, not in 16. But still, like, this is a crazy season that Cooper Cup's having. Um, 92.7 on the wide receiver cornerback matchup, 7.3 out of 10 on wide, on the wide receiver strength of schedule, 39.4 points allowed per game over the last six in PPR by San Francisco to opposing wide receivers. Cooper Cup, not that he wouldn't be, but he's number one in my ranks again this week. So you got a tough decision. Like this week, um, if you're playing DFS tournaments and you're knowing like, look, I got to have Cup or I've got to have Jonathan Taylor um, in my lineup, like it's going to be tough to fit them both. Like it's going to be really hard to fit both of those guys. And both of them have monster matchups um, in great spots. Um, Odell Beckham Jr., just real quickly, with the fact that Van Jefferson didn't play as much last week and we've got more of a rotation, I think there is an opportunity here, Ian, for really – Beckham to establish himself as the locked in number two in this passing attack, which we know Stafford has struggled here lately. We know that Stafford, you know, can be inaccurate. He can be erratic. A lot of things can go wrong. But in the end of the day, like it's still a top five offense, right? In the NFL, it's still one of the offenses that's the most uh, fantasy friendly as far as scoring touchdowns, um, getting down inside the five, all the things in, or inside the 10, all the things that we want to see. So with Beckham, um, 7.3, obviously out of 10, same same wide receiver strength of schedule as we have have for Cup, but also wide receiver cornerback matchup of 75 overall. So Beckham going to be borderline, going to be close to being in my top 24 this week. Five touchdowns in his last six games. And look, I do enjoy trolling Browns Nation on Twitter, but spare me this idea when people try to put down OBJ with his yards per game. Points win football games. Touchdowns are going to win a tiebreaker eight days of the week. So I don't want to hear about these other wide receivers that have the same amount of yards as OBJ. And look at the way he's scoring, man. Most of these touchdowns, he had the bomb against the Packers. I believe every other one was inside the five or 10 yard line, one on one coverage, got open in the short area of the field. And as we've seen with Stafford over the past few weeks, certainly an upgrade over Baker, but also not exactly like he's playing with Tom Brady out there. Last matchup, Sunday night football. No, Monday night this week. We got the Chargers at the Raiders. Chargers sitting as three-point favorites. Game total of 49 and a half. Somehow, Dwayne, the Raiders are not eliminated from the playoffs. Obviously, the Chargers aren't as well, but this game and does mean a lot for both teams. They've won three in a row, I think. So, I mean, the Raiders, you know, and that's a huge win against the Colts last week. Like, that was, that was, that was a big win. But, yeah, like, it's pretty simple for both of these teams Win and you're in. The Chargers have a backdoor option here um, if the Colts lose, and they'll know ahead of time if the Colts have lost, you know, um, or not. So, but just win and in. So it's. You, I think this is a great spot to be in. Like it's like we couldn't pick a better Sunday night football game. Like the way to end the weekend was with the two teams that like they're both battling it out, like to have a spot in the playoffs. So I think you can trust both of these teams. Um, obviously, they're not going to be on the main slate since it's Sunday night, but you can trust all the starters from these teams. Obviously feeling great about Herbert and Eckler after their years, but I want to kind of use this opportunity to talk about something that we did beat into the freaking ground throughout this offseason. It's the idea that drops do not matter in fantasy. Look, I mean... They don't matter in real life. It's not sticky. Yes, but like after seeing what happened with Jamar Chase and how he legitimately dropped like 10 spots in the wide receiver ranks during August because of drops, that should put a freaking knife in this. But just to, you know, again, beat a dead horse, I'll go through what we've seen this year. Here are the drop leaders. With 10, Debo Samuel and Tyreek Hill. With 9, Jamar Chase. Guys that had 8 drops this year. Jalen Waddle, Justin Jefferson, A.J. Brown, D.J. Moore, Keenan Allen, Claypool, Van Jefferson, LaVisca Chenault. And, you know, of course you can say, oh, Visca impacted him. Whatever. With 7, Cooper Cup himself, C.D. Lamb, and Mike Williams. So say it with me, people. Drops don't matter in fantasy. Now, a fair point to bring up is those are raw drops. And as we know, they correlate with targets. Even drop rates, man. They don't You're going to be hard-pressed to find a situ situation where it matters so out of 82 wide receivers with 50 plus targets here are some drop rates and again if you're close to 82 that's bad Debo 76 Claypool 76 AJ Brown 75th Jamar Chase 74th Tyreek 65th CD 64th Waddle 58th Jefferson 52nd Keenan 53rd drops don't matter in fantasy and I'm fine if you want to say they don't matter in real life as well go ahead all I know is that they don't matter in fantasy. And with that, Dwayne, talk to me about a Raiders team well, that I'm, sure, I'm sure they yeah. matter. Like in the context of a game, there's been drops that have cost people a game. But the bigger right. point being, you cannot 
you cannot grade a receiver like, are you going to give them a contract? How much are you going to pay them? What do you think they're going to perform for your team? Which, let's face it, like, yeah, we're talking fantasy, but like real GMs are trying to figure out like which players give them the best chance to win just like we do. Like it's just in a different way. Um, but at the end of the day, like drops are not predictive to what you're going to see the next year. And that's what got us on Deontay Johnson at such a value this year. Gotta love that. Now, Dwayne, with the Raiders, you mentioned it big win last week. That was actually just the second time since returning from their week eight bye that this offense had scored more than even 17 points. Do they keep the relatively good times rolling here? What are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, I love Hunter Renfro this week. An 8.9 out of 10 on the wide receiver strength of schedule and 87.5 on the wide receiver cornerback matchup. We talked about Zay Jones and the waiver wire. Uh, no, we didn't really have a waiver wire show, but just some kind of our takeaways around utilization that we did yesterday. And Zay Jones has been up there as far as targets for the last four weeks. Now, we do get Darren Waller back potentially this week. We'll have to wait and see. You know, he was working his way back last week, and then he got COVID. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. But if he comes back, that's obviously going to dampen things um, from a standpoint for uh, Zay Jones. But for Hunter Renfro, man, I just, like, I can't believe how good Hunter Renfro is. Like, I really can't. Like, And it's not to say that I don't think, I don't believe it now, because I do. Um, but it's just like I never thought that Hunter Renfro could be a top 12 PPR fantasy receiver. Here we are. He's number 11. You know, essentially, God. he did the Amon Ra St. Brown thing kind of like a month before Amon Ra St. Brown. And then they kind of <laughs> swapped. So it's like those two guys have done and they play similar positions. Um, but Renfro and Carr, man, like they're just they're in perfect sync, man. It's like hand and glove kind of stuff going on. And uh, his quarterback loves him. It's tough to cover a guy in the slot. What's funny is he does face um, more help coverage, more bracket coverage than a lot of people think. Like, so other teams know that Hunter Renfro is their main guy. But when you get to operate from inside and you're so quick and you can do the things he can do and you can have these releases to where you're basically reading the coverage um, and you can go outside or inside and it's all a lot of it's on timing. And so he and Carr are just like so in lockstep, like it's just hard to take him away in, in, in the role that he plays. Yeah, and I mean, even on a per game basis, the dude wide receiver 16 ahead of guys like Cook, C.D. Lamb, Hollywood Brown, Hopkins, Metcalf, truly special year for one Hunter Renfro. Everyone, hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, I invite you to use code FANCY and go get you 25% off any PFF subscription. You can get all of our locked article content. Fancy ranks through the playoffs. No, we are not quitting on you, even though your fantasy season is probably over. Continuing to grind, you can also check out our betting dashboards, player prop tools, that and so much more. Support the pod and use promo code FANCY for 25% off any subscription. Also want to point out Manscaped. You can go to manscaped.com and use code PFF for 20% off and free shipping set your first new year's resolution with good intentions and join the four million men worldwide who trust manscape with our exclusive offer go to manscape.com and use code pff for 20 percent off and free shipping again that's 20 percent off with free shipping at manscape.com and use code pff it's new year no pubes in 2022 with manscape also, shout out to DraftKings. You can download DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code PFF. Bet just $5 on any football team, college, or pro, and win $200 in free bets if they're victorious. That's promo code PFF this week at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 years old. New Jersey and there in Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Minimum $5 deposit, $1 wager, one per customer. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com. So support for details. Gambling problem. Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Also, got to give a shout out to our friends over at Western and Southern. One of the best offers we've had the privilege of giving to you guys on this podcast. All you have to do is ask a question to Chris Collinsworth about literally anything over at westernsouthern.com slash ask Chris. One more time, that is westernsouthern.com slash ask Chris. Now make you eligible to win catering up to $2,500 for the big game on February 13th, 2022. If you're watching on YouTube, check out the link in the description below. Again, that's westernsouthern.com slash ask Chris. And remember, with Western Southern, you can rest assured on game day. Look at us, Dwayne, breaking down an entire week in under two hours. Give us the freaking Nobel Prize or some shit. Yeah, we missed our we missed our goal. We had a stretch goal, right, of 90 minutes, but we did yeah. keep it under two hours. So, uh, yeah, applause. Applause to us. <laughs> applause to us. For Dwayne, I mean, thanks as always for tuning in to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. And until next time, take care, everybody. <laughs>